Good afternoon and uh, welcome everyone. Um, you know, I hope uh, all of you and the IMT fraternity is keeping well during these uh, rather turbulent COVID times. My name is Puneet Gupta. I'm a part of the adjunct faculty at IMT Ghaziabad. And uh, this is a first in a series of, uh, uh, you know, alumni webcasts on topics of interest. And uh, hopefully this is a starting point uh, for more informative and value add sessions uh, for all of the attendees. Uh, and, and, you know, um, help spark up a little bit of the alumni engagement uh, within IMT Ghaziabad. Uh, of course, you have one of your own uh, as well on the call today and uh, part of our speaker panel uh, who would introduce in just a sec. And I'd also like to just thank the director, uh, the dean, the dean research and academic and uh, uh, specifically uh, Professor Sapna and Reema and of course the rest of the faculty for uh, starting this initiative. I think this will go a long way in creating uh, educational content uh, for the institute uh, as, as well as the students. So, uh, so let's get started. I think uh, you know everybody's had so many of these web calls. Everybody's familiar with uh, the ground rules, uh, but just to uh, uh, iterate them, uh, there, there are three speakers today, uh, and uh, uh, you know we are essentially going to be uh, sort of conducting this in a fireside chat. Uh, type uh, uh, program, and I would uh, request if all of you could keep your uh, video and audio on the mute, uh, so that uh, you know we can uh, run this smoothly. And also, uh, any questions that pop up uh, at any point in time uh, during our conversations, please feel free to type them in the chat box. Uh, or if you're having, sometimes there is some people are having trouble uh, typing them in the chat box. You can email them to me at pgupta at imt.edu, uh, and I'd be happy to ring this up uh, with all the panelists. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, again, uh, it's meant to be a free-flowing discussion, so you can ask the questions, but um, unfortunately, just to keep it organized, we'll keep the questions limited to the chat box, uh, and, and uh, if there's some issue with the chat box, then we... So our topic today uh, is of venture capital and angel investing, and... Um, Really, I think as a part of our discussion, we're trying to cover three things. Number one, we'll, we'll give you a bit of an overview of venture capital and angel investing. Two, uh, it's our understanding that there are two types of audiences today on the call. One is folks who are, have been entrepreneurs and want to continue or are going to be new entrepreneurs. So they are looking to better understand how do I get capital from venture capitalists or high nets or angel investors. And then there may be another set of folks on the call who are wanting to be angel investors and who are saying, okay, how do I decide where should I put my money? Which is a good company, you know, uh, and, and, you know, what should I look for? And I actually, quite, quite frankly, uh, both of these things are almost identical with a few nuances here and there, which of course we'll go into. Um, so uh, again, the, the sort of the three areas for today, we'll give you an overview of VC and angel. We'll uh, talk a little bit about investment decision-making in the context of, entrepreneurs looking for venture money. And lastly, we'll talk about investment decision-making in the context of an angel investor. Two or three are kind of interlinked and overlap, but still whatever differences there are, we'll, we'll try to highlight them. Um, and uh, if there are any questions outside of these, again, feel free to ask them. So without any further ado, let me, uh, let me start by inviting uh, the three folks that we have today. And uh, perhaps uh, if they would be so kind to introduce themselves. So let's start with uh, uh, Mr. Kunal Khatter. Uh, Kunal, if you'd be so kind to introduce yourself, please. Sure. So, thanks, Puneet. Hi, everyone. My name is Kunal. Um, I am currently the managing partner of an early stage seed fund based out of Delhi called Advantage. Uh, we focus predominantly, uh, so we're a sector focused fund. We make investments in the area of, of mobility and in mobility, we include everything from electric, um, electrification, EV uh, to uh, logistics and distribution to e-commerce in the automotive space, as well as connected slash smart cars. My background roughly basically I grew up in Delhi itself, um, went to college, uh, uh, and did my got my MBA from four school. I uh, worked for three years here, and then I went and did a second master's um, from from uh, from Chicago. Uh, and after that, I've been in the valley in technology pretty much throughout my life. Everything from uh, technology consulting to um, entrepreneurship, 
um, to private equity, uh, moved back to India, 2009, became an entrepreneur, set up India's first multi-brand auto solutions company called Carnation Auto, raised two rounds of PE money, uh, pivoted the business from asset heavy, asset light, made it profitable, uh, exited and sold that business to uh, Mahindra. I've uh, been an angel investor for now close to 10, 11 years and, and became a, 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 a structured institutional investor, so-called VC, back in 2016, I think is when we cut my first check. I had a very small uh, subset of LPs, which are limited partners from whom I'd raised capital. Two of my three LPs came from strong automotive background. Um, so we ended up making a lot of investments in that space, which did well. And now I'm on my second fund. Um, and we continue with the similar strategy of investing in, in companies in that same space, many of whom have been hit with COVID right now. Uh, but the way we look at it is that if you've got a nine to 10 year investment horizon, then this is actually a good time to invest because ultimately business will turn around, markets will recover. Um, and you're making investments at better better valuation today than, than, than you were six months ago. So that's pretty much my background. Thank you. Thank you, Kunal. Um, may I now request Mr. Girish Shivani uh, to talk about his background? And by the way, he he is one of uh, the IMT alums. Uh, so perhaps Girish can also share some of his uh, pleasant IMT memories. Uh, and he's an active alum. He's contributed a lot uh, to the Institute in various ways. Uh, so Girish, over to you, please. Uh, thanks, Puneet. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Girish Shivani. Uh, I passed out from IMT in 93, uh, majored in finance, uh, was for eight years in financial services across Delhi and Bombay, and then for about 13 years in comms, media, and entertainment, uh, including IT consulting. Uh, 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 before I started Lornest, which is an early stage uh, venture capital fund focused primarily on the B2B side of the world, uh, and then very sharply focused on deep tech opportunities emerging out of India on the product side. Uh, uh, typically, first round of institutional capital, half a million, million dollars from a big spot perspective. Uh, uh, before I started the fund, I was heading uh, 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 the telecom consulting practice for Southeast Asia for a company called Teradita. Uh, I worked with every telco between Chandigarh and Manila. Uh, and, uh, you know, I used to have the free sales in India. Uh, so I basically come from finance and technology background. Uh, happy to be a part of this panel. Uh, and, and, Thank you, uh, thank you, Girish. I'll uh, now turn it over to Mr. Atul Full. Uh, Atul, uh, if you'd be so kind to please share uh, your uh, background with us. Great, um, thank you uh, very much, Puneet. Um, so I uh, grew up in the U.S. Um, I moved to India 14 years ago. Um, based in Mumbai currently. Um, I've about uh, the past 22 years, I've worked uh, eight in the U.S., 14 uh, of those, as I mentioned, in India. The first part of my career was focused mainly on wealth management, communications, and marketing. Um, worked on Wall Street with firms like Goldman Sachs and Merrill Lynch. Uh, and then in the past decade, I shifted to focusing on the alternative asset management industry. Uh, and really within that, uh, fund of funds and, and also uh, capital raising. Um, so I've worked with firms such as Guggenheim, ICICI Venture, uh, and Everstone Capital, um, raising capital across private equity, venture capital, real estate, uh, and public equities. Um, and this is predominantly raising capital from foreign uh, investors to invest into India. Uh, and um, uh, for the last two years, I've been running my own uh, boutique consulting practice, focusing on the same thing, working with uh, alternative asset managers to help them with their capital raising needs. Thanks, Atul. So uh, let's let's dive right in. Perhaps, uh, Atul, could you uh, start us off with uh, uh, you know sort of giving us an overview of how you think about venture capital, private equity, uh, you know, segmentation from let's say early stage, mid to large. Who are the key players? And I ask you to introduce it because you know you've sort of been a fund of funds guy and looked at the variety of different funds. So it'd be great if you can share some of your perspectives uh, and and feel free to throw in what you think makes for a good early stage, makes for a good uh, mid stage, and and so forth. Okay, sure, great. Um, so I, I think if if you look at the spectrum uh, of uh, private equity, 
obviously you have on the angel side, and then as you get more institutional, you have the seed funds, and, and slowly moving up your, um, uh, you know, your seed funds, your early stage funds, um, moving into uh, mid market, into growth, into buyout. So that's kind of the, the spectrum of private equity and VC, which often gets lumped together. Um, I think one thing that's interesting, I think VC also, sometimes people confuse VC with just being uh, technology, um, but also I think it refers more to the stage of the company that you're investing in. Uh, and as Kunal was mentioning about mobility and there's multiple industries, there's a technology angle in many things, but you know, there's obviously other, other industries where there's a lot of activity happening on the consumer side, on the industrial side, uh, et cetera. Um, in terms of the evolution within India, you know, really, you could say there were a few players who were active in this space since the early, since the late 90s. Um, TDICI, which was a part of ICICI Venture, some of the early foreign firms, um, you know, uh, Westbridge, Chris Capital. There have been a few players who were active, um, but these were small, very small pools of capital, and it was a very nascent market. I think it was really in 2006 that you saw the uh, private equity market in India, you know, come of age. Uh, and that was primarily driven by the liquidity uh, that was awash. So this is pre the global financial crisis, pre the GFC, there was so much money that um, this industry class came up. A lot of people, former investment bankers, people who were immigrating back from the US, uh, entrepreneurs, um, not, not as much as entrepreneurs, probably more investment bankers and professionals that tried it in, in that wave. Um, and that was the first, I would say, iteration of uh, uh, private equity. Uh, and then since then, you've seen the market grow dramatically. Um, you know, performance has been difficult in many ways, but you've seen the market grow and evolve. And I would say, as you look at Kunal and Girish, it's probably getting to that. that that's a really good example of that evolution in terms of focus, in terms of the right professionals, you know, adding value, uh, the, the right people at the, uh, the health firms and breaking down their specific area of expertise and investment focus. So I would say that's the stage we've been in for the past few years where you're actually getting the specialization of focus, whether it's going to be, you know, early stage mobility, whether it's going to be uh, seed consumer, uh, food and beverage, um, whether it's going to be SaaS, whether it's going to be um, you know, in industrial, but it's going to be buyouts, you know, whatever that niche is, you're starting to see that get a little more defined as the industry evolves. So I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there and you know, you see if there's anything else you wanted to cover. Great, great. Uh, thanks, Atul. So uh, I think what you're saying is, you know, within the spectrum of early to late stage, uh, there is a, a segment, let's just call it seed early and growth. Um, and so that is sort of the focus of our discussion today um, from a vantage point of what it constitutes to be a VC or the angel investment, because that's that's how uh, we would define it. So I just wanted to sort of focus in, you know, uh, a lot of what we may talk about may not extend to the entire spectrum. It may be limited to the early stage VC, seed growth, pre-seed pre type of market. So um, in, in that context, I think, uh, um, you know, there are, uh, and, and so uh, I just I just happen to uh, be in a fortunate position of knowing uh, this for a fact out of conversations with Girish and Kunal for some of the research I'm doing. But uh, uh, I know in a segment-focused fund, and Girish is probably more horizontal technology-focused fund. And uh, so it would be good to hear the thesis that Kunal and Girish have and why they have it. And, and the reason I'm bringing this up uh, for the audience is, you know, as entrepreneurs, when you are going out and raising money, it is important for you to know who is the best guy to go and raise money from. So, for example, if you are doing something in automotive enablement space or mobility space, I don't think there's anybody better than Kunal in this country. He understands the space. He's invested in the space. He has operating background in the space. And so when you take a venture like that to him, I think your chances of having a very strategic investor in addition to capital get significantly enhanced. And similarly, if you were doing something in the deep tech or the semiconductor area, I don't think there's anybody better than Girish 
because that is their core focus. They've been around that. They've operated in those segments. And, and, and you know, these sorts of things are important for entrepreneurs to know. So uh, in that context, let me uh, switch it over to Girish. Uh, if, if Girish, you can talk a little bit about your fund, your thesis, and what sort of entrepreneurs, uh, you know, should should look at your nest and why you chose that thesis uh, within the early stage realm, please. Sure. Thank you. So, uh, so we've also evolved, you know. So this is a this is not a journey. This is not a static, uh, you know, place that one is in. When we started in 2012, uh, you know, all three of us actually came from telecom background, uh, and we'd seen how wealth had been created on the voice side of the world, and that was early days of. Uh, internet in the country, and we thought you know, similar or larger opportunity exists. You know, uh, if you were to build a platform to leverage uh, data and access to internet, etc., uh, for 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 large uh, markets, and and therefore the first fund was primarily a small, you know, 90 crore fund, uh, which focused on essentially doing tech and tech enabled opportunities. Uh, but we were more, uh, we were looking at everything. Or well. uh, and but uh, early enough in the life of the fund, we realized that all three of us came from uh, you know enterprise backgrounds, and therefore our understanding of the consumer part of the business was fairly shallow, and and we pivoted to a purely B two B focused fund back in 2014. Uh, uh, you know, so in that sense, we were uh, you know we had a head start uh, in terms of building a great B two B focused portfolio. Out of the 16 investments we did in the first fund, nine of them were pure B2B platforms. Uh, and, uh, and that kind of held us in good stead because as capital died up in 2004 and 15, and as I think back in 2019, uh, 2019 uh, you know, a lot of our company, a lot of consumer companies were struggling uh, to raise capital, etc. You know, we were we were saved from that. B2B is a slightly more tricky place because... Girish, may I interrupt? Your yeah. voice is going in in and out a little bit. Uh, uh, perhaps, uh, okay. I don't know if there's a way to come closer to the mic or... Is it better? That yes, much better. Thank okay. you. Okay, so yeah, so I will just... Yeah, so so we focused on the entire B2B cycle of the world. So, so you know, suddenly B2B became flavor of the uh, year, literally in 2018-19. And by that time, we'd already built a very interesting portfolio of about eight, nine companies. Uh, the second fund we conceptualized in 2016, uh, yeah. and that was a time when you know there was a lot of push from the government to do, you know, make in India, startup India, digital uh, India, etc. And we realized that uh, we were at the cusp of uh, actually going out and building a product nation. You know, so we, as a, from IT services perspective, we were already there. You know, IT services was accounting for close to 100 billion dollars in, in market cap, in revenues, etc. And therefore, we thought it was a good time. And and a lot of these guys who were within within the IT services domain were actually moving out and breaking out on their own, starting their own startup, doing stuff, productizing some of the services that they were doing, etc. And we thought that that could be a great, uh, you know, place uh, to leapfrog into becoming a product nation, literally in that sense. And so the second fund uh, is a forty million dollar fund, uh, where we are, where the focus is very sharply defined on the deep tech part of the world. You know, uh, when I say deep tech, there are two legs to it. One is the entire hardware leg, around sensors, robotics, wearables, etc. Uh, you know, so five out of the last eight investments we've done have been literally have some element of hardware in them. Uh, and then the entire uh, you know software leg of it, which includes uh, robotic process automation, AI, ML, and opportunities around distributed ledger technologies and uh, you know uh, mixed reality, virtual reality, as well as enterprise SaaS. So that's how, how broadly the fund is kind of uh, structured. And and the, as I said, the thesis is an evolving uh, you know exercise in any fund. Uh, you know, and when you start with a certain investment thesis, and you see that the ecosystem is either moving, uh, you know, uh, moving in a different direction, then you have to do a course correction and get it to a stage where, you know, it kind of fits in. So for us, because the thesis is more broadly horizontal, as Puneet said, in terms of what we do, on purely from a technology perspective, uh, from a vertical perspective, we look at everything. So we look at fintech, we have fintech investments, we have edtech investments, we have investments in the domain of enterprise SaaS, we have investments in wearables, or companion robots, you know, and 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 the likes. So, so it's so therefore it's been a fairly eclectic mix of uh, you know companies that one has been able to build 
with the anchor theme around deep tech and uh, tech and tech enabled opportunities so that's how the evolution actually happened uh, we we also realized in 2016 that you know we uh, our understanding of the hardware side of the world was limited so we actually went down and onboarded two more general partners who came from hardware background you know so we are always on the lookout of filling gaps within the uh, within the fund itself in terms of whatever uh, we think is the right thesis and we don't have the skill set we are happy to go and onboard partners as well and continue to build the uh, franchise um, so today you know we would be among the top three four five funds in the country from a uh, you know returns perspective from an investment thesis perspective from a brand awareness etc uh, so that's that's what we've done in the last eight nine years okay, super thank you um Kunal, uh, you're on mute please. Please. we cannot hear you oh sorry super thank you uh, can you hear me now kunal over to you please yeah. Yeah, yeah, great. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so I think why why we became so focused for um, so when we started off investing, uh, this was our first fund, and you know, um, uh, so I started this pretty late in my career. So then I I asked uh, we asked a simple question is um, how long will it take for us to become a well established you know best in class kind of a brand, um, uh, and and you know uh, so that you know. Some of the best founders who want to start come to us. Uh, typically, what will happen is, uh, you know, good quality founders when they think of raising institutional capital, they will go to the brands that are uh, that are famous or well known, or have been around for a long, long time. So, how do you create a brand in an organization or an environment? It takes time. So we said, look, if we remain a generalist fund, it will probably take us 10, 10, 15 years to establish ourselves as a brand. So, you know, and I guess this is something they teach you in business school is that if you're not a market leader in a segment then create a segment uh, or narrow down your focus. So we said, okay, maybe I will not become a Sequoia or a Lightspeed, which are the two, you know, uh, probably the best known uh, brands in, in, in what we do in the next 10, 15 years, but can I become a Sequoia or Lightspeed in a narrow category of mobility and transportation? Why mobility and transportation? I guess it was a natural progression um having spent 10 years in the auto industry myself um, and having learned about the nuances of the aftermarket space and the pains and how oems uh, uh, sort of uh, you know work and more importantly recognizing very early about this whole marketplace model of shared mobility um, uber had just entered into india we saw ola had got funded and we said wait a minute this looks like an interesting play um, and ultimately, when I went to raise capital, also you reach out to people that you already uh, have worked with in some form or the other. So my LPs themselves came from the same domain. Um, my anchor LP was is one of the world's largest auto component manufacturer. My second LP is the world's largest two wheeler manufacturer. So we said, okay, rather than being just a fund which is deploying dumb capital, let's pick it a platform play where we bring a lot to the table, not just money because ultimately the color of money is the same right so the only thing that differentiates you from others is what are you bringing to the table that's over and above that so one is domain knowledge one is also lps um, who come in with their own ecosystem their own network their own uh, core competencies and skill sets and can and can somehow the companies that you're investing in leverage that capability uh, that experience that network to create uh, to build a successful company ultimately investing is, is like a funnel if you ask me you can start up with x number of investments and only a few of them will succeed now the question is what happens in the next the, uh, in the two to three years from the time you start invest you come in and to the time they go on to raise a series c or d typically a three-year cycle what can you do to increase the probability of of allowing the company to succeed succeed more importantly become market leader once you become a market leader in your space, you know, enough funds. So market leaders will typically end up attracting almost 60-70% of the total capital that gets deployed in that space. Um, I think we've been very fortunate that because we were sector focused, we deployed capital based on a specific thesis and deployed capital in companies that uh, three of the investments that we've made have become market leaders and now, uh, you know, are attracting um, investments from some of the world's largest private equity, venture capital, hedge funds in the world. 
companies like Shuttle based out of Gurgaon, Rapido, which is a bike taxi company based out of uh, Bangalore, and Chalo, which is uh, a technology company improving public transportation. So these are three example of, uh, examples of companies where we came in early, uh, brought in uh, capital, uh, domain knowledge, experience, expertise, but also leverage the ecosystems of our employees and, uh, and, and, and help them become market leaders. So it seemed to have worked in the first uh, fund. In the second fund, we sort of uh, made some changes, refined the approach, uh, expanded the scope from shared mobility to more on the electrification side, et cetera. Um, and uh, in spite of COVID hitting us, uh, I think we're going to double down on this. Um, and we think that, uh, like I mentioned before, with a nine to 10 year investment horizon, I think COVID is, uh, is uh, probably a year that's going to affect all of us. And I think six months are already behind us. So it's another question of six months. After that, I think uh, mobility as a category um, is, is not a discretionary spend. It's an essential spend. I think this work from home will probably affect not more than 1% to 2% of total number of daily commuters. We don't think it's a material number. Unfortunately, as a fund, we've always focused on the middle or bottom of the pyramid anyways. So we don't think that's going to be challenged uh, uh, in the long term at all. Um, so therefore, we think that's the reason why we're sector specific, but we do, uh, on the other side, we've also hedged our investments to some extent where we will make a few minority investments in sectors outside of mobility, just so that at the end of the day, we have a certain hedge to uh, one or two specific areas. Um, it all allows us to do some diversification, but those are investments that we will probably not lead. We will co-invest with some other funds who probably have strengths in that, that area itself. So that's overall the thesis of the fund. Back to you, Punik. Thank you, uh, Kunal. Uh, that's a fantastic overview, gentlemen. So I think we'll get into uh, uh, what the audience is really looking to hear, which is how the hell do I get money from VCs? Or what do VCs look for uh, when I take a startup to them? And uh, and so I'll, I'll, I'll set this up in uh, probably a, uh, uh, in, in turn that, uh, you know, broadly segment the decision criteria for, for our discussion today, but we don't have to necessarily stick to that segmentation. So, you know, generally speaking, when uh, uh, VCs are looking or even angel investors are looking for investing in a company, in a private company, in a startup company of the type that we're talking about, uh, it's about three things. It's about people, it's about product, and it's about market. Uh, of course, this terminology may change from one investor to the other, or, or you know, the more famous words are, do you invest in a horse or a jockey? And, you know, there's lots of variety of ways that people try to dumb down or simplify the investment decision-making process for the understanding of uh, a broader set of audiences. So, Kunal, I'll, I'll start with you here. Um, if you could walk us through, um, you know, what what is it that you are looking for? Now, we've established that you got a segment, uh, but you know, outside of that, provided they are in your segment of interest, um, what is it that you're looking for? Uh, and perhaps to the extent possible in that segmentation of people, product and, and market, but we don't have to. So over to you, thank you. Sure, thank you. Um, so I know, you, uh, so, so I think you can, there are many ways you can answer that question. I think it's, um, probably the most relevant or important questions, both for a VC as well as an entrepreneur. Um, so I think a few things. Number one, I think the, the best form of capital is your customer. You know, um, so I think it's important, first of all, for entrepreneurs to recognize that, um, first of all, they should become entrepreneurs for the right reason. So let's assume that you're becoming entrepreneurs for the right reason. Um, all businesses are not venture capital funded businesses, right? There are some which are typically cash flow businesses, um, which are not really attractive to VCs. Um, and then all lifestyle businesses. So first you have to be very clear in terms of the kind of business you're starting or the, or the, or the product or solution you want to build. Is it a lifestyle business or is it a VC funded business? And I could spend an hour trying to explain the two, but let's for a moment assume that it's a VC funded business, um, which means that you have the ability to, uh, emphatically grow the value of the inherent business or the underlying technology significantly, maybe to a factor of 100x over the next 10 years. So therefore, that's what the kind of return 
that the VCs do. The VC model itself is structured in such a way that they're looking for Hail Mary kind of investments. So they'll get a 20, 30x on one investment, they'll probably end up writing off 50% of what they invest in. Um, so they're not looking typically for life for, for cash flow businesses. Profitable, yes, but not necessarily cash flow businesses. Um, so that's one very important factor. Um, ultimately, so as a fund, we have two investment criteria. Uh, we do what's called mentor building, where we invest in entrepreneurs who come to us with uh, without a product, without revenue. So pre-product, pre-revenue kind of investments. Um, these are entrepreneurs who are talented, are hungry, are still, but still not sure in terms of what they want to do. And they come to us and say, can you help us figure out what the product uh, or the solution is? Um, and then we've got uh, seed investing where we typically back entrepreneurs who, who built somewhat some of something related closely related to a product it could be a, a early stage product in beta or whatever but at least they have the ability to sit down and give a product demo they may have done a pilot they may have signed up a few customers which is great and it's in us in a in an area or a category that we're looking to invest in and where we think we can add value so that's a seed investment You've got the, the, the mentor building in check that we write. These are typically much smaller checks, 40, 50 lakhs, 100, uh, 1 crore, where we're giving them enough capital to actually build the business out to a point where we have proof of concept and maybe proof of acceptance, where we then go to the market and raise a larger sum of capital. Seed investments is typically larger checks where they have somewhat of a product uh, in place. I think the number one thing that people forget and it's, you know, um, is what we've realized is um, there are very, very few entrepreneurs who actually start with the problem statement. Um, so which a problem statement very specifically means it's basically a small set of customers there who have a hair on fire problem, uh, which is not being solved by an existing technology or solution. So once you've identified the problem statement, now it's much easier to build a solution around that. You'd be surprised how many people build a solution and then run around trying to find the problem that it solves. Um, and it's easy within, now that we must have looked at, we must have filtered or gone through over a thousand business plans, probably met over 300 entrepreneurs and invested in 27, 28 of them. We have, it's pretty easy for us to differentiate between those who have come with a genuine solution for a genuine problem and those who come to us with a solution without knowing what the problem is in the first place. Uh, early stage investments, you're definitely backing the entrepreneurs, not necessarily the idea per se. Um, I would say 70 to 80% of our portfolio companies have actually ended up pivoting from the initial thesis or the initial investment uh, business that we, uh, we, we deployed capital on, still in the same domain, but the product or the solution has undergone significant change. Ultimately, good talented entrepreneurs have the ability to and are open to uh, continuously pivot and change their business model as in more uh, more data or uh, more feedback comes back from the market. Uh, we're very worried and scared about entrepreneurs who are so uh, married to their idea that they refuse to recognize that the data and customers telling them something else, but they keep uh, chiseling away and hammering away at the same idea, even though things are not working. Um, so we love entrepreneurs who are passionate about uh, solving problems, not entrepreneurs who are very, very focused on the, on the solution that they've built. Because problem statements keep evolving and therefore the solutions must evolve as well. Um, I mean, those are some of the criteria. Now, if you want to know specifically, as a fund, because we're sector focused, we've actually spent over six months of research having identified all the vertical, sub-vertical, sub-segments, and we've, uh, we have typically 15 business opportunities that we've already identified where we have seen what we've done as, as a gap analysis about business opportunities here in India compared to successes that we've seen in other markets. We're actually looking to plug those 15 business opportunities. And it could be as diverse as electric motors we're looking for, we're looking for retail leasing businesses of electric companies and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and typically these are ideas we throw at uh, good entrepreneurs who come to us who probably either don't have a good business in mind or come to us with a suboptimal business or an idea and we try to convince them to do something where we've already done some research work on. Um, so it's a combination of all these factors. Um, yeah. Super. Um, Girish, your views? Yeah. So 
I think I will actually like to uh, add on what Kunal said, okay? Uh, and I think a lot of founders actually, uh, or, or wannabe entrepreneurs actually don't understand the economics around the VC model. You know, and that clearly defines whether your business is actually VC fundable or lifestyle as Kunal said, you know? So uh, if you were to, if, I, if I'm a fund with an eight year life, for example, and I raise 100 rupees from my LPs, uh, you know, 10 of that, 10 of that goes into expenses. So I have 90 left to deploy. Assuming I deploy those that 19 across, you know, 10 companies equally, nine rupees each. Okay. Uh, typically at the stage at which we come in, 50% two-year mortality is about 50%, which means five out of these 10 opportunities will actually not see the light of the day for more than 24 months. Okay. Uh, which means actually at any given point in time, only 45 is working for me. Okay. So that's on the deployment side of it. If I were to look at from from the supply side of it, any investor who's putting in, uh, you know, a rupee with me is comparing it as an asset class to public markets, private markets, etc. And typical return expectation is 25, 30%. Okay. If you were to compound 100 rupees over an average five, six year life of the fund, that number comes to about 500. So, so at off the gate, if your opportunity cannot return on a deployment of nine rupees, 90 rupees back to me or 100 rupees back to me, it does not work, you know. Uh, it's simple It's simple back of the envelope maths. So if I'm looking at an opportunity where I'm looking to deploy half a million, million dollars, assuming I take 20, 25% stake in that company, uh, you know, it takes, does three, four, five rounds of uh, valuation. And by the time I exit with my 10% uh, left on the table, uh, if the company is not valued at 100, 150 million dollars, it does, it's not worth my while. So therefore, as entrepreneurs, if you are building businesses which are going to be, you know, 20 crore revenue, you know, five years from now, damn good lifestyle business, you will make four or five crores of profit. Will a, will, a, will a VC fund it? Unlikely. And therefore, if you are not trying to solve a large enough problem and get to a stage where you scale up well and get decent valuation on the table for from an investor's perspective, uh, you know, uh, you will not go to get through the gate. So, so I think that's the biggest challenge that we see in the understanding of the entrepreneur. You know, we ran this program called SOAR. Uh, you know, we started on 1st of May, two week uh, rapid funding program. Our typical cycle is about 12 to 16 weeks. We said we will give you a term sheet in four weeks from the date of, you know, final closure of the application. Uh, by 15th June, uh, so we ended up with about 1,500 odd applications in two weeks, okay? In the last hour of the uh, submission, I was getting four applications a minute. You know, we got 800 applications on the last day. You know, but but when you started sifting through some of the stuff, you realize that one, the problem that some of these guys are trying to solve for is not a large enough problem. Two, as Kunal said, people are trying to find a problem to solve for because they have a solution. You know, I'm just thinking to myself, 1900 and out of that 1900, we shortlisted 64 from that 64, we went to 16 and we are now ending up investing in five. You know, uh, I must have seen about 17,000 opportunities in the last eight, in our eight and a half years. And we've invested in 24 or 25 of them. So that's the hit rate. The, the point I'm trying to make is that, you know, with so many people trying to solve for problems which are truly not large enough from a institutional capital perspective you know there is there is this certain element of uh, shock that one is experiencing from the ecosystem and and therefore you know it is imperative for the wannabe entrepreneurs to understand how this model works and then go and try and find a problem to solve which is large enough which is worth their while which in five to six eight ten years will get them to a stage where it is uh, it is worth uh, worthwhile and for us as investors also where we can make you know uh, 30 40 40 40 40 50 percent irr okay at a, at a fund level so that's the biggest challenge that i see as a gap uh, in the in the in the ecosystem uh, I, I would agree with Kunal when he says that, you know, at the stage at which we come in, it is all about people. Even in our evaluation criteria, 60-70% of the evaluation is centered around people, you know, and and we are of the firm belief that an A-class team, even with a B-class idea, will convert that B-class idea, pivot and get to an A-class idea. But a B-class team with an A-class idea will run that A-class idea also into the ground. You know, so those are th those are things that one, one evaluates, you know, so team, 
largeness of the problem that you're trying to solve for how what is your competitive landscape we are very very sharply focused on p you know you really don't want to get into a business model where suddenly you have 500 other people trying to solve for the same problem so is there some core ip that you are creating which which is basically creating a ring fence around 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 your revenue business model what is the moat you know so those are those are some of the uh, uh, parameters that one looks at uh, as one evaluates some of these opportunities on an ongoing basis uh but uh, could all rightly you know hit the nail on the head you know it's mostly about people and then all this stuff about product market fit largest of the opportunity and you know technology modes etc cetera, etc cetera. you know um we need if i can add on just, uh, just yes please just just two two line or one 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 comment and one question actually but one comment is uh, to follow on to what girish was saying he, he quickly or he correctly identified the uh, commercial aspect and that is one of the things that as investors globally have looked at the venture, uh, the VC asset class, their return expectations are very high. They understand it's high risk, but they want the high reward. And one of the biggest knocks to date on India has been the, uh, on Indian funds has been the performance. So I think this is part of that evolution where they're not taking the risk to get a 3X on a fund level. Um, you know, that doesn't, that doesn't get anybody excited. Um, but what they really want are those home runs. They're willing to take the risk and the write-offs, but they want those massively scalable businesses. And now you're starting to see uh, firms be able to show the ability to identify in a re repeatable process, identify these winners. But I think it's only now in the last literally probably four years that some teams and some firms are emerging and, and setting that track record. So that's one thing I just to give that in, in uh, perspective. and. One one question, you know, for for Girish and Kunal, I know that you mentioned about teams right now, uh, Girish. But um, how? What is your view on solo entrepreneur versus team when people come to you? For both of you, that's that's one thing you talked about the the nature of an entrepreneur to be able to pivot. But what about solo versus teams? I was interested to hear that. Yeah, so uh, we are extremely uh, wary of solo entrepreneurs. Okay, uh, it's not that out of twenty five, we have one. Uh, company one uh, where we actually uh, you know took a punt on a solo entrepreneur. Uh, our construct internally is that you at least need two, if not three. Uh, and the reason around it is uh, uh, you know threefold. One, we are a deep tech fund, so therefore you need some guy to who understands the technology intimately, inside out, and can drive the product roadmap. Okay. Uh, the second is an operations guy or a subject matter expertise. Uh, you know, as I call, what is the problem that you're trying to solve for, and therefore. How does that technology? How does the technology stack that you're working with solve for that problem? And the third is a hardcore finance person. You know, fundraising is a full-time job. You know, it, if you if you if you compromise on on your fundraising capability, or if one of the founders is doubling down as a fundraiser as well while running the operations, you tend to compromise both. So for us, the ideal mix is a three-member team with complementary skill sets. Uh, one being a technology guy, one being a subject matter expert, and one being a core hardcore finance fundraising operations guy. Okay, uh, uh, we are also uh, we uh, out of the 25 investments that we've done, two have been husband wife co-founders. You know, uh, I think I think there are challenges in that construct in some form and manner as well, and therefore I'm slightly more cautious now when I look at uh, founding teams. Uh, you know, spouses are involved. Hope that answers your question. Yeah, to add to that, I think I agree with Girish. I think we've also been a little wary about solo. See, entrepreneurship by the nature itself is very, 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 very hard. Um, you know, I think one of the things that uh, a lot of people become entrepreneurs to the point I raised earlier for the wrong reason, they get carried away with what they read in the newspaper and all about the fame and fortune. You know, ultimately media will cover the stories of that 0.1% of entrepreneurs who become successful, not the 99% who have not. And I'm not saying 99% will fail, just that they don't achieve the kind of success that will get you on the cover of a magazine. Um, so therefore it's a tough life. And I think trying to just uh, keep at it for eight, nine years uh, as a solo founder is very, very tough, especially if, if every function responsibility is falling on you tech, product, business development, sales, fundraising, operations, customers, et cetera, et cetera. So it's always good to share that burden with others. 
especially others who believe in that vision and will stick with you. Employees come and go. Hired founders is a terrible, terrible model. It's never worked. They'll come and leave. Somebody offers them 25% more pay, they'll keep going. So that's a rotating door. It's the founders who stick around. Um, every every startup that I have invested in or have achieved success will go through at least one, if not two, near-death experiences. Uh, they'll run out, run out of cash. Uh, you know, founders typically will spend 70, 80% of their first three-year journey with no salaries. So there are sacrifices they're making at home. Um, only if you're a team of two or three will you actually, you know, you listen to each other and pull each other up in that journey. If you're a solo founder, you're not taking any ideas. You're not open to ideas. So one is, uh, uh, you know, solo versus multiple founding only. The other way to classify it, we have other, uh, there's another way we classify it. Uh, one, we have founders which are fresh out of college, uh, which are first time founders. And we've had, uh, I would say, pretty mixed experience there. Um, I don't know, and I know I'm talking to IMT here. I think we need to do a better job in teaching entrepreneurship, both in school as well as in college. Um, I think we, we have the quality of our students are probably world-class, but I think many of them um, are still not, and I, I can see that's changing, and I'm so happy to see events like this, which is allowing people to do that, but I think we've got to make it a bit more structured. And the second is successful founders, uh, first time uh, seasoned experienced founders and failed entrepreneurs. We love failed entrepreneurs. Um, I would say 60, 70% of my portfolio right now consists of failed entrepreneurs. Um, and the reason why we make failed entrepreneurs, two reasons. One is um, failed entrepreneurs at least will not repeat the same mistake they did in their previous startup, which means that you've got a higher probability of success Second is a failed entrepreneur has not given up and gone back to the corporate world. Now on his second attempt, he's actually going to work twice as hard because he's going to prove to himself, to his wife, to his kids, to his parents, that he's not wasting his time. So I think the probability of success of failed entrepreneurs is much more. Now, if you've failed three or four times, then that's another problem altogether. But, uh, so that's the way I would classify it. Solo versus uh, uh, multiple founders and First time versus failed versus successful founders. No, and I think uh, uh, Kunal rightly said, you know, this is a uh, entrepreneurship is a fairly lonely journey. Okay, and therefore, at times, all you you actually need a shoulder to cry on as well. And therefore, you know, the moral and uh, uh, you know uh, moral support that your founders provide you in times of distress. And I can tell you, every company goes through that. You know, no company in my portfolio has been to the cliff and not come back, you know, uh, you know uh, or, or or has not been to the cliff, literally in that sense. And therefore, you know, uh, additional people help, uh, you know, uh, you can, they are good sounding boards. Uh, your visions are aligned in terms of trying to solve for the same problem. We've seen we've seen challenges in teams where, you know, founders are not aligned. So, for example, one of the way for us to do this is we actually to speak to founders individually. Uh, at some point in time to understand whether the when the, there's unification of vision at a founder level because a lot of times we've seen somebody wants to you know build a 50 crore company somebody wants to build a 5000 crore company and therefore there is no or very little uh, commonality between their vision their drive and the reason to uh, you know be together uh, and those and those are the kind of signals one uh, kind of looks for in some of these interactions that one has with founders on an ongoing basis Atul, your views on uh, what you look for in uh, VC founders? <laughs> I think, uh, you know, um, team is definitely the most important factor as well. Um, and the people aspect of it, if I may. Not the people aspect. I Sorry, I'm saying the people aspect of it. So, you know, just like we focused a wee bit on the people aspect of what a VC looks for, um, yeah. in funding the entrepreneurial team, if you were funding a VC, if you were, you know, what is the people side of it, the equivalent, so to speak? Sure. So it's actually very similar. Um, it's very similar in the sense that you want a team. Uh, part of the reason we would look at a team uh, would also be to mitigate your risk. Because if you have one uh, member, one, one gen member of the general partnership or one GP, and he or she were to leave, then the whole fund would collapse. So you want a strong team. Um, you also look for how much money are they managing? What is the strategy? And is the, do they have enough personnel to, to do that? 
So it doesn't necessarily have to be a large team, um, you know, especially given the nature of the investments in VC, it can be a small team, um, but a, a few, few complementary founders. That's definitely uh, something that is viewed as favorably. Um, you know, one of the other things we look at are the economic split between the founders to make sure that there's a that there's alignment and that there are incentives in place um, because this is a very long game. So this isn't like the public markets where you put money today and if things aren't going well, you get out tomorrow, it's liquid, it's transparent. Here, these investments are gonna be writing it up for, you know, your investors are giving you capital, the VCs are giving the entrepreneurs capital for five, six, seven, eight years at times. Um, so you wanna make sure that everyone's aligned and focused on the long-term game so that they can create that value that Girish was talking about. Um, so th those are a few of the things we look at. Also track record, um, you know, becomes very important, uh, increasingly so now, early on when the venture capital space in India was more nascent, people just wanted exposure. So perhaps you would look at the macro and the strategy. But one of the things we like to say is, you know, strategy is overrated in India. It's about the execution. You know, so you, so you can't talk about the trends of uh, emerging middle class, of the GDP growth, of urbanization. That's one thing, but you really have to look at what is that, you know, to the point that uh, Kunal was talking about, what problem are you solving? What are you addressing? But you have to go in the micro a little bit. So I think now when, when VC funds are evaluated, I think the entrepreneurs would also evaluate it as, as you touched on. You look for what is that area of specialization and what is unique about their approach and their story and how are they trying to make money? It's not a cut and paste model that this is what worked globally. Now let's do the same types of investments here. You need to look at, you know, what are those nuances that are relevant to the market and how are you going to address it? Um, and then how are you going to attack it? So I think that's part of, again, that, that evolution, looking at the, the right team, the qualified team with the right track record and a differentiated investment thesis. Um, and then the last part uh, would be sourcing ability. How can this team actually source deals? So yes, they're there, they're qualified, they have an investment thesis, but what is their ability to source deals? You know, otherwise it doesn't matter. If they can't secure those uh, uh, the best entrepreneurs or the best deal flow, then um, that would be, uh, you know, uh, that wouldn't be a check mark. So we'd be looking for that as well. I think that probably covers the, the big items. No, oh, thank you. And, and, you know, one of the reasons I asked this question is because a lot of the, the and Kunal and I were casually discussing this uh, prior to the start of the conversation, and this was coming up. You know, a lot of the people think that uh, VCs are in a very cushy position to dole out capital to entrepreneurs. In fact, they are going through the same rigors in terms of raising that capital from the LPs. And, and that's why, you know, when you talked about your list, you may have used a different vernacular and a vocabulary, but the checklist and the essence of the checklist is, is significantly similar. And therefore, uh, you know, that uh, that similarity is, is very interesting. I think uh, the other part, um, so, you know, people, I, I just, you know, want to sort of segment it for simplicity of understanding people, product, market, and we've talked about the people part uh, in, in a fair bit of detail. Uh, you know, there's interesting things about single founder and, uh, you know, non-single founder. There's interesting things about folks who failed in the past. And Kunal talked about why uh, he loves the fact that they've learned from their experiences and, you know, now are going to work doubly hard. Uh, Girish talked about the husband-wife couple, which can be a, uh, you know, sort of a mixed bag uh, sometimes. I've heard, and in my own investing, I've seen both sides, you know, they've worked out and they've not worked out. So the jury's out on, um, on how that pans. Um, floors open, uh, just on the people side, um, anything else, uh, you, you know, so uh, I've heard things, uh, I've had guys tell me, you know, I'm very interested in analytical abilities. I'm very interested in their ability to think logically. I'm very interested in their ability to execute. Uh, et cetera. So, uh, you know, any thoughts on how the hell do you evaluate these? You know, I've, I've done 10 plus years of investing and I can tell you, I'm totally at loss on how do you evaluate some of these things. So if you would be kind to share some of this with the audience so that at least the potential entrepreneurs can look in the mirror and say, hey, 
do I have some of these qualities? And uh, if not, how do I build them? So floors open, anybody who wants to come in on additional things that you look for on the people side and specifically ability to execute, ability to you know, be analytical, which are sort of important. Um, how do you evaluate these? So let me let me uh, jump in here. So, so yes, these are absolutely critical qualities. Okay, and therefore you need a specialist to do this for you. You know, it is not, you know, uh, for example, I am a numbers and a technology background. To expect me to do this is not is being unreal. Okay, um, and therefore what we've done is, uh, you know, I have a full time uh, partner uh, who's, who's been an executive coach and a leadership development guy in his earlier avatar. Um, and his only job is to evaluate people, evaluate founders, evaluate teams, evaluate their, uh, you know, direct reporties, etc. You know, and uh, uh, and uh, he's the only guy on the IC, for example, who has veto power. You know, so if Sanjay stands up in a room and says that these people are not worth, uh, you know, uh, backing up, we will walk away from that transaction. Literally, in that, in literally, that's the level of, you know, comfort one has in in his uh, abilities and capabilities to evaluate founders. And and his way of interacting with the founders is very uh, unique. So he doesn't look at the decks. He doesn't look at what their business model is. He just goes in and has a free flowing chat with them in terms of trying to understand what are their drivers, what is their vision, what are they trying to solve for, et cetera, et cetera. You know, and, and he has an uncanny knack of ensuring that people let down their guard, uh, you know, when they speak to them. So, so you know, so for us, it's it's a very, very person-specific, uh, you know, uh, evaluation and feedback that we rely on, uh, and and we realized early enough that this is a people's game, and therefore, uh, if you have you need somebody who who is able to drill down and get under the skin of the entrepreneur, literally, to figure out the true drivers, uh, uh, you know, of, of, of what what really drives them. No, so that's the way we do it. We have, uh, we have, we have not tried anything else, uh, and it has worked perfectly for us. Uh, you know, uh, that's what. Yeah. So adding to that, I think that's very important. I think there are, uh, you know, if you had to sit down and look at qualities of a founder, uh, what we do is we typically so there are some things that you can teach a founder and some things that you can't. I think it's important to understand. Um, so you need soft skills and hard skills. Um, I think if ultimately the founder has to be a damn good salesperson. Uh, he's selling to everybody. He's selling his vision to investors. He's selling his product to customers. He's selling his uh, mission to his employees. He's motivating them. So he's got to be a very, very good salesperson. I can tell you many companies that we've invested in have not done well is because they might have the best product. They might have the best team. But if uh, unfortunately none of the founders were good salespeople and they just couldn't get the product or the business across the finishing line. And it's very unfortunate. Um, we all know for a fact that, and there are case studies in every business school about where it's not always the best product that wins. It's either the company that has the best distribution or a founder that's a great, great salesperson. And I don't think, um, I think selling is a skill set that you cannot really teach. It's, it's talent, you're either born with it or you're not. Um, so that's one thing that we look for. At least one founder has to have that ability. Doesn't necessarily have to be the, the person who's going to take the leadership role. It could be the second or third, doesn't matter. The second is perseverance. Um, many people will work very, very hard and be very focused and be at it for a year or two or three. If things don't go their way. They start you know, giving up and stuff like that. Again, you cannot teach that. Um, so that's the second thing. Um, then again, there are certain qualities that you can hire and certain qualities that you cannot. So I think it's, it's uh, we have to also be practical and, and we are also realistic. And when we know that if the, all the founders as a group will not necessarily have all the skill sets or the talent or the experience required to succeed, you can always hire a second level of management that will fill in those gaps. But I think as early stage investors, it's important, and this is one of the biggest roles that we play, is being able to identify very early on that what is the current gaps in the skill sets amongst the founder set, and um, how do we fill those gaps up, and when do we fill those up? Because typically, in the early stage, you may not have the necessary capital to go out there and hire an ex-McKinsey guy or and stuff like that, 
at that times we as a fund we typically bring in some of our um our team members as either you know entrepreneurs in residence or so for example there's a company which we realized has great team but they didn't really have the ability to put together proper proper product roadmaps or documentation so we went and sent one of the art tech analysts and spent three months there and help them put together all those documents and the fire and the wi fi frames and all that and once they raised that second round of capital we helped them uh, hire the right person to, and took over that responsibility so it's a but it's it's, it's a, so these are all the things that we look for in a, in a team atul any thoughts from you on uh, additional component on the people side and the same thing for the fund managers Sure, you know, I, it's a, I, I won't uh, reiterate more of, of what the guy said, but I think one way to sum up um, something that becomes important is, you know, people do business with people they like. Uh, and it's a very uh, nebulous sort of thing and subjective in many ways, but, you know, there has to be a fit. And again, the nature of what we're talking about is not a transaction. This is a relationship um, with the entrepreneur and the fund, with the fund and its LPs. These are long-term relationships. So, you know, I think it's important to look for those things when you're choosing a partner uh, of uh, communication, the ability to relate. Uh, and, you know, I think Kunal and Grish drilled into to, to more specifics, so I won't reiterate that. Uh, I will share one uh, anecdote of, um, you know, how uh, things can come back or how it's important to, you know, be aware of your surroundings. But I, I've had actually two, two investors, these are global institutional investors, who have told me that they, did not invest in a fund because of the way that um, a fund and an entrepreneur in both cases, because of the way that they acted in a restaurant. So the way that they treated the staff, you know, uh, actually turned them off because they felt if they can't be respectful to the staff or they're being rude to the staff, it actually was a red flag for them as what might happen later in the relationship. And they just didn't want to be in bed with someone like that for the next 10 years. So just uh, an example of, again, people do business with people they like. Yeah, no, thank you. And I think uh, all of you are saying this, but haven't sort of said it in those words, is the basics of uh, being a good human being, having the utmost integrity and honesty and, and, and you know, uh, being able to demonstrate them by way of your behavior is also an important criteria in terms of the team. Um, so moving and switching gears a wee bit um, on the product and, um, you know, sort of the market side, uh, you know, there's a lot of discussion about um, are there specific benchmarks you can look at, let's say, uh, from a market perspective, um, you know, are, if the incumbent market is, uh, let's say, uh, deeply fragmented, um, either on the supply side or the demand side, it's a more interesting market, it's a larger opportunity to organize, or if... Uh, you know, there is some sort of a long tail effect, uh, then potentially, uh, you know, it's a more interesting market. So without necessarily throwing the, uh, the jargon, um, you know, can, can we simplify and say, hey, uh, these are the types of markets or the market structures, clearly size is important, but besides the, the size of the market, the target market opportunity, is there something in the market that looks very interesting um, in you know as a part of your evaluation process? So, Kunal, do you want to go first? Yeah. So, I mean, so that's I think um, uh, Tam, as we I think you're referring to Tam, right? Total addressable market. Um, yeah, that's absolutely an important criteria. Um, I think it's one of many. Uh, criteria that we look for from an investment point of view. Um, but it's not the only criteria, of course. And the reason for that is that we also know that businesses will evolve. The product will also evolve. Uh, you would add elements to it, which may be complementary or adjacent to the problems that you're currently solving. For example, that will open up and expand the total market that you're able to address. So you can start with the you know, a, a very specific use case, which is always typically better to do. I think one of the things we get worried is that entrepreneurs also realize that um, VCs are looking for large stamps, so they'll come and, and pitch an idea which is trying to do 10 things. 
which may be complimentary, but then you, the question is how are you going to really, you know, get it right? Because it's such a broad uh, problem statement that you're trying to solve. Um, so I think we typically look for roadmaps where we look at the structured way or the structured approach where entrepreneurs are saying, okay, this is my 10 year vision. This is what I want to do, but let me break that down into, you know, um, uh, three year cohorts because th this is what the first three year sprint looks like then the next three years and the next three years. And I know for a fact that there's a high probability that journey is going to evolve as we go along. Um, product market fit, if it works or not in the first cohort, will determine whether you continue to work in that direction or significantly pivot away to some other uh, business problem that you're looking to solve. Um, so that's why we think that ultimately talented A category, A plus founders will figure out uh, the product as they go along. I think how we solve for it is by we are anyways investing in a in a sector where there are 900 million commutes happening every day on an all India basis, probably 300 million in the top 10 or 15 cities. So we know that the market's big enough and there's enough problems to solve. I mean, um, so I'll just take a minute here to explain, you know, when I moved back um, um, after living in the US for 10 years, <clears throat> when I decided to move back to India, a lot of my friends from Kellogg and, and colleagues and all asked me, what's wrong with you? You know, America, uh, and I was in the Bay Area. They're saying there's so much to do here. Uh, why are you going to India? There's so many problems, you know, nothing works there. I said, I'm going to India because there are so many problems, nothing works. Can you imagine how many successful businesses you can build? Um, so it depends on how you look at it. So for us, that's that's important. So it's not a, it's not the be all and end all because things will evolve. But yes, definitely if the if the space that you're operating itself and in India, quite honestly, any business that you pick up will have the potential to become a billion dollar company. It's all about execution. Execution is the, probably 90% uh, of the reason why companies succeed. Everything else sorts itself out. Yeah, that's a great point, Kunal. I think uh, a lot of the times you start thinking about a market and three years later, you're tackling a totally different market sometimes. Or, you know, and, and it's the, you are actually rewarding the ability of the entrepreneur to move to the right market. So doing too much of an evaluation of the market itself perhaps sometimes can also be an impediment. Um, uh, Girish, your views? No, no, I would absolutely tend to agree with Kunal. I think, you know, uh, I am yet to see a business model which has been executed the way it was, an, uh, you know, anticipated to be executed on an Excel sheet. You know, uh, and, and therefore the entrepreneur's ability to find the right niche that works for them, uh, you know, and, and create impact uh, both from a value perspective uh, for their customer as well as for the, from a solutioning perspective uh, is extremely important and and therefore uh, you know some of these uh, opportunities that we see where uh, you know earlier also we uh, alluded about finding uh, having a solution and trying to find a problem for that solution to solve for is absolutely disaster waiting to happen you know I, and therefore uh, you know uh, the uh, Fortunately or unfortunately, you know, the ecosystem that you're working in is evolving by the moment. Okay. You know, and therefore, if you are not able to, if you don't as an entrepreneur have a vision to be able to foresee how a certain change in technology slash offering is going to impact you 6, 12, 18 months from now, then uh, to my mind, you've lost the plot. You know, especially in, the, in this, in this post-COVID world. You know, people who were your, who, who you were, who you thought were never going to compete with you suddenly because the paradigm has shifted now or have become your biggest competitors. And people who you thought were your competitors, you know, you are now becoming your partners. And therefore, some of these shocks that the system, you know, experiences on a, on a regular basis, whether it is, you know, drying up of capital, whether it is COVID, whether it is, you know, anything else on the macroeconomic side. Uh, the, the founder's ability to be able to find, to stay relevant, uh, you know, is extremely, extremely critical. And therefore, uh, whatever market you want to start with, uh, that is not going to be the be all and end all of what you as a company will end up doing if you are a smart entrepreneur. So, um, Atul, the question, I, I'd modify the question a wee bit for you. 
um, you know, in, if you were in the early 2000, 2005 era, and you were a venture capital fund and you were going after BPOs as an investment category, you were making a hell of a lot of money. Then, you know, internet, e-commerce was hot. And then some, you know, marketplaces are still hot, but were hotter earlier. <laughs> and now it's deep tech. So, uh, you know, how do you sort of, what would you say in terms of the venture community and their thesis on the industry itself and its transition over the years uh, it's, you know, so-called hot, not hot. Where does the money get put in? Because there is some level of herd mentality there, right? To keep Girish and Kunal honest. I, I can't put Kunal too much into it because he said, I'm focused. I'm only doing this, man. <laughs> so a little bit more pressure on Girish. But what do you, what do you think? So I, I think there is a, a definitely a herd mentality. Uh, so, so you're talking about um, from the point of view of the industry, what the industry is focused on. Yeah, I, I think it's differentiation now. I think if you look now, people are not saying cut and paste. You know, I think a lot of people early on were maybe people who had come back from the US or people who had been at global firms and were saying this worked here, it's here. But now people are being very specific. You know, you've heard Kunal and Girish multiple times talk about what is the problem that you're trying to solve, right? So that the strategy is also there. People are focusing on whether it's artificial intelligence, whether it's machine learning, whether it's mobility, whether it's deep tech, whether it's SaaS, where you have a center of excellence in India, but you have a deeper product uh, market fit outside. So there are more, uh, you know, better business models. So I think that specialization, um, and, and you see that not just in technology, but also in consumer. You know, uh, I'm gonna do, um, there's a whole plethora of funds that have come up that focused on consumer brands, new brands, millennial brands, um, sustainable brands. So I, I think the biggest thing that has changed in the last few years is the specialization of the focus of VC funds. Um, you still have your larger funds. Uh, you know, we've mentioned a few of them, the Sequoias, the Lightspeeds, the Excels who are raising, you know, Sequoia just raised uh, $1.3 billion for its latest fund, split among 800 million for a, a later stage growth and uh, 500 million for an earlier stage growth. Axel's latest fund was 550 million. Um, Lightspeed, I think, raised 350 million in their last fund. So there, there will be some investors who will, you know, get their index exposure or tick the box that I, I have my allocation to India Venture and I'm done. Um, but more, more and more, I think you're seeing funds which are starting out in that 40 to 70, 80 million dollar range. And they're getting their thesis right. They're proving it. And in the next five to ten years, or five to eight years, you'll start to see those funds continue to get bigger. I believe. Um, but that, yeah, I would say that's the evolution that I've that I've seen and that that we talk about. And the other thing which is important is exits. So you know, one of the things that happened here, uh, you had a number of write-ups, but monetization events. So I think that's another thing that is going to be important as well is actual modernizations and returning money. And that's why I think some of the specialized, more focused funds are gonna be more thoughtful and they're gonna be more positioned to actually give results, which eventually will matter. Absolutely, absolutely, guys. And so changing, to, just to sorry, add to that, yeah, just to add to that, you know, uh, as entrepreneurs are trying to find the niches that they want to address, you know, we at fund level are also trying to find uh, you know, areas uh, of, of technology which are going to become, the you know, the flavor of the month, if you might say, you know, maybe 18 months, 24 months from now. So we are, as, 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 a, as, as the guy who drives the investment thesis at a fund level, I think uh, what gives me sleepless nights is essentially what is happening out there which could disrupt what we are doing today, 18 months from now. You know, and therefore it's a constant uh, uh, education struggle to keep abreast uh, with, with what's happening on the side of technology and continue to evolve the thesis. You know, for example, uh, now that we are midway in the second fund, you know, I have clearly defined two or three areas that are uh, gaps in my uh, portfolio. For example, I'm looking at a cybersecurity opportunity to invest in. Okay, I'm looking at a distributed ledger technology application opportunity to invest in you know so these are clearly articulated gaps in the in the deep tech uh, thesis that one has built 
and therefore one is now actively seeking opportunities in that space and that's what that's how the, you know the thesis and the and the portfolio design kind of evolves in a in a in a fund which is slightly more horizontal so I, you know one, one other uh, just to add from an entrepreneur's point of view one of the things early on also you know vc funds were and property funds were just seen as capital providers but i think that is changing also because as the VC funds themselves have evolved and the entrepreneurs are also evolving. The whole ecosystem is evolving. Now, you know, smart entrepreneurs are also being picky about who they go with and where they want to be because it's not just the capital. It's also the ecosystem, the operations expertise, the uh, administrative expertise, the ecosystem of investors of capital and future rounds and helping them grow their business and how to attract, you know, how to execute that 10 year vision. So I think that's another thing that I've I've seen as well as entrepreneur changing um, their expectations and uh, their views and what their partner should look like in terms of who they take capital from. Absolutely. Yeah, excellent point, guys. Um, I think uh, one of the questions that's come up on the chat and it's the the sort of the most uh, hotly asked questions typically. So so we'll change gears and go in that direction. Um, how the hell do you guys come up with the valuations for your companies? Uh, what, you know, how does one value a company for a few billion dollars and another one for 10? So, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, not an easy question to answer, but uh, who's brave enough to take it first? <laughs> oh, see, there's no science behind it. If you can figure it out, let us know. <laughs> Uh, absolutely. I think I think I think people have I think people have not realized that valuation is actually a derivative. Okay, it's a function of how much money you want to raise and how much do you want to dilute. So if you just simplistically break it into those two, uh, you know, parameters, valuation is just a derivative. So therefore, the way we look at opportunities is how much money you are uh, looking to raise for the next eighteen to twenty-four months. And what is it that is on the table uh, that you want to leave for us as investors? You know, um, I would prefer a kidney and a half a lung. Uh, somebody would prefer only one eye and half a year, uh, and and therefore we will come at a come at a you know at a number which will work for all of us. You know, people don't realize you know and uh, and I, I give this analogy very often. When do transactions happen? Okay, transaction happens when there is a price match. Uh, between the buyer and the seller, but there is a value perception mismatch. So I, as a buyer, I'm thinking that I've got a great deal if I'm selling this, uh, you know, asset for 100 rupees and uh, buying this asset for 100 rupees. And uh, my counterparty as a seller is very happy because he knows it is worth 95 and he's getting 100 for it. So there's a price match, but there's a value perception mismatch. And, and, and as uh, investors, it is our, uh, uh, you know, intent and interest to ensure that the gap between the two is the least. And that's what we aim for, you know, and everything else to my mind uh, from a valuation perspective is a derivative. So, so that, so the day the entrepreneur, uh, you know, uh, understand this as a construct, uh, transactions happen uh, seamlessly. Kunal. No, absolutely. I think that's a very important factor. Um, I, I think ultimately it's demand and supply. Just like everything else in the market, uh, whether it's shares or equity, whether it's real estate, whether it's, um, you know, any other physical or liquid assets. Uh, and I think it's an art. I mean, there is no art, there is no science. It's X for Y to Girish's point. Um, but ultimately, I think it's if, uh, you know, just like we typically end up investing in one out of 100 deals we do. Um, even entrepreneurs have, um, will, if they have the luxury of choice and if they have, you know, multiple term sheets, they will also end up choosing the ones that they feel is the best. Uh, uh, and they will also employ or, or use various criteria and I encourage them to. It's not always about, uh, it's not always about dilution uh, and how much money an investor is offering. It's the quality of the investor. Um, I can honestly tell you, I have said no to a number of um, investment opportunities, which I knew would end up making money for me, 
but I was on enough, honest enough to tell them is that I'm not the right investor for you. I don't think I can add the kind of value that you really want. And I would give them two or three names of investors who are probably better suited to the business that they're trying to do. Um, I may have ended up giving them uh, less valuation or more valuation, but it's, I think it's not just the valuation that's determined. Um, but as companies evolve, they become bigger and bigger. I think when you have multiple ways in which to arrive at that, it could be a DCF method, it could be comparables, which are other companies in this category value that in terms of scale, it's in the multiple of GMV, is it a multiple of revenue? EBITDA multiple to our industry, so let's not even go down that path. Uh, and then when you get into public markets, then of course your you uh, market and shares are, are, uh, used, uh, are analyzed and valued by a different set of investors altogether. So that thing, it, it's, it's a moving target. And, and at every stage of your startup, uh, there are different criteria used to determine what you're worth. And guess what? In 80% of the time, these are all academic discussions because companies either don't get exited or they become, they, sh they shut down. So yes, it's great for, you know, mental exercises and all at the end of the day, if your company is extremely successful, whether you end up with 6% or 10% equity, it doesn't matter. And similarly, if the company fails, then whether you have 6% or 90%, it doesn't matter. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, there's there's a question that has come up, uh, Atul, if you can throw some light on it, which talks about uh, what are my alternatives if I don't want to dilute my equity, I want to raise against debt um, and, uh, you know, would investors look at debt funding? Uh, so, uh, you know, it'd be great if you could uh, tell us a little bit about the debt uh, funding market for startups. Uh, and uh, how that has come about and who are some of the players uh, that would be very useful. Sure, sure. Uh, so um, it, it, it is a uh, emerging asset class in India. It's called venture debt. Uh, it is a global, uh, a global phenomenon. Um, and what typically what happens is as the venture capital, the primary market, as it increases in size and gets to a certain scale, then it leads to the launch and the evolution of the venture debt market. So it sort of goes sequentially. Um, and in India, uh, the first player that was involved with this was a, a firm called Silicon Valley Bank. Um, they were then bought by uh, Temasek, the Singaporean uh, sovereign fund. And um, now they operate under a brand called Innovin. So the, the players who do venture debt in India today include Innovin, um, Trifecta, uh, and um, then you have a few smaller players who are getting into it. Th those are the two larger ones. Um, there's a firm called Strides, which has now raised some capital as in getting active in this space. Uh, Northern Arc uh, is another one which is uh, getting active. So you have smaller pools of capital which are uh, getting active. You also have some of the wealth management platforms, you know, depending on the, the company and the opportunity, they have at times aggregated uh, and, and raised money from their HNI investors. So, you know, it is possible to raise uh, debt, but the characteristics, you, 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 a pure startup, I don't think it would be extremely easy. The, the, the venture debt firms would be looking for a certain amount of uh, scale and cash flows and um, the ability to service that debt as well. Um, so I think it, it comes later in the evolution. Uh, oftentimes the venture capital fund itself, the same way the entrepreneur doesn't want dilution, the venture capital fund won't want dilution either, and they 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 encourage venture debt um, as well if it's a bridge, uh, you know, round of uh, capital raising. Um, but in pure startups, it would be less uh, less institutional sources, and that would be more, you know, uh, friends and family uh, if you were to organize some money. But as you get in order to access institutional debt, you would have to be slightly larger. That would be my um, uh, my view on it. Right. No, absolutely. I think uh, the very function of debt means you've got to be able to service it through cash flow, which may be asset based or, or otherwise. And so it's harder to do that in a startup. Um, and, and, you know, I, I think every time we talk about valuations, people tend to ask the question on debt 
<laughs> so I I just thought it was a very sort of a natural progression uh, in the minds of the audience. Um, and um, okay, so uh, you know, I someone's asked the question: What time period projections do they typically look for? I I suspect they uh, this is in the context of a venture investor coming in, uh, putting money in a startup, then maybe doing another round with them. Uh, so if uh, uh, Girish and Kunal, you guys can talk a wee bit about the average lifespan. You know, you come in and pre-seed or seed, and then a few years or a few months, you know, you do a Series A, and so you know, you're generally fairly long-term investors. But if you can just provide some color on it, that'd be helpful. Sure, I, I can. Start. So yeah, we are early stage investors. Um, I think the, the, you know, I think uh, Girish mentioned it earlier. So typically fund cycles are nine, 10 years. And these are cohorts, right? So, so we typically start a fund. We typically have two to three years of deployment, two years of management and two to three years of exit. That's how uh, fund structures operate. So depending on whether, you know, we come in uh, within the first year of deployment or the third year of deployment that and it's very easy for people to ask and they, I encourage entrepreneurs to ask the, the VCs also is in terms of how many years into the cycle are they in. That will give a, a pretty solid perspective in terms of what's the exit horizon. Um, because we come in very early, what we've realized that in India, uh, you know, building, uh, so we think typically entrepreneurship is a 10 to 15 year journey. So unfortunately, we as far as we probably will not be around to see companies evolve to that point where they are unicorns or they are going public, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, going public in India is, is extremely challenging because of the prerequisites of profitability that you've got to show. So our is strategy has to be very clear from day one. As funds, uh, we typically don't like to enter um, a company uh, without knowing where the exit door is and, and what are our potential exit options. Is it strategic? Is it uh, acquisition? Or is it an earlier late stage investor coming in giving us secondary? Which is why philosophically we as a fund, we keep telling ourselves that we're building indicons and not unicorns. Given the seven or eight year horizon, we think the probability of us building a 150 to $200 million company is probably higher than building a billion dollar company. So keeping those factors into mind, that's typically the time horizon and our entry point and exit point is, is very clear to us. And therefore, it's very, very critical for us that if we are exiting at a 150 to 200 million, then the, our shareholding has, uh, what is our, our typical equity holding? And that could be after two to three rounds of investments and one to two rounds of uh, a dilution because we typically will not participate beyond three rounds of an investment. Um, and therefore, uh, our entry point, our check size, and our equity on day one is very, very important for us to know. I mean, these are all internal calculations we do before we make that investment. But uh, long answer, but that's these are the different things that we look for. And I think that it's very important for even entrepreneurs to understand our, our, our VC's way of thinking so that we are aligned in terms of both what we are looking for in terms of investment and what is typically the, 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 the period with which we'll be working together for this. Girish? Absolutely, and I fully agree with you, Kunal. And I think, uh, you know, answering the question directly, as I said, you know, at any given point in time, we are looking to fund for 18 to 24 months. You know, so at least for that period of, uh, uh, you know, fund utilization, I am looking at at least a quarterly number, uh, you know, from a projections perspective. And beyond that, even if it's an annual number, I'm happy to look at it. But broadly, over a five-year period, uh, right at the gate, I want to know how much capital are you looking to deploy, you know? So if it's, a, if it's a million now, then 18 months from now, what is it that you are looking to raise and where will that take you? Uh, and, and that, to my mind, is extremely important because, as Kunal said, our typical life cycle are five to six years. And I need to know, you know, in five years, how much capital will get deployed, what will be my uh, exit holding, and, and when I exit at a certain value, what will I make at a fund level? So all these, all these equations, all these derivatives are essentially looking at the fund life, looking at the investment thesis, and looking at the total uh, capital efficiency uh, that the model has inherently built in. You know, uh, uh, and, and that's what uh, one looks at. You know, and if you if I, if I you send me projections where you say your time is a billion dollars and you will corner $600 million out of it, then obviously there's a challenge there. 
you know and therefore you know some of those validations of the assumptions that you do when you build out some of these projections are extremely important for us you know uh, at early stage at the stage at which we come in you know the key assumptions around revenue model how much is your customer going to pay you what is your customer acquisition cost going to be you know uh, uh, what are your overheads etc become slightly more significant because the pools of capital available from a deployment perspective are limited but as you scale up some of these questions go out of the window literally in that sense uh, and therefore uh, any uh, you know as entrepreneurs anywhere between 3 to 5 years of projections um, at least the first 6 8 quarters uh, you know on a quarterly basis and beyond that annual is something that i would look look at before we would take a final call in terms of an investment decision great great gentlemen could uh, each one of you uh, perhaps starting with atul talk a wee bit about uh, one of the best deals that you've done um, and why and what is the worst deal you've done um, and you know what were the learnings from it so to speak um, and, and uh, atul i'm sure you have a lot of war stories from everstone but you could just pick one uh, that's your favorite um, sort of the best and the worst and the learnings Sure. No, I'll uh, I'll actually um, uh, within Everstone we had a uh, a venture capital arm, uh, DSG Consumer Partners, um, which focused on seed and uh, Series A investments in the consumer space. Um, I think you know probably one of the best uh, um, experiences uh, and and some of the lessons learned was a, a brand called Epigamia. Uh, so Epigamia was a it is a, the, the the leading uh, Greek yogurt brand in India. In fact, it was the pioneer that introduced the brand into India. And um, you know a few a few examples from many of the things that Kunal and Girish have touched on. Um, you know, in terms of pivot, uh, the entrepreneur who was a co-founder uh, was a gentleman named Rohan Mirchandani. And um, Rohan's journey actually began uh, as a ice cream parlors under the brand Hokey Pokey. So he had identified dairy. Uh, he had I thought, ice cream, and then he pivoted into uh, yogurt, uh, and slowly that became a core business. Um, so that was one one example. Another thing he chose very wisely, the funds that he went with. So um, he took money from uh, he had a number of suitors uh, early on, and he took money from uh, DSG Consumer Partners because of the focus on the consumer space and the ecosystem that that brought. Uh, and importantly, one of the investors, uh, and uh, you know, Kunal had touched on this, that his LPs are in the automotive space. Um, in this case, one of DSG's uh, LPs is, is a is a family office, a European family office, who is one of the largest food and beverage families in the world. So they have make food and beverage investments all across the globe, um, and they were able to a bring that expertise to fore, and b because they're a a family office, they have a different uh, timeline in terms of their investments. So while funds can come in for four or five years and then they want to exit, this family office is able to ride that journey for longer. So I think you know it was a, a good selection in terms of partners, A, from getting the support of the fund uh, and the uh, competency of the fund, but also getting the support of longer term capital. Uh, and in fact, that's played out. So over that first investment was made in 2015, I believe. Uh, and you know, fast forward five years, the company's raised uh, well more than $50 million. Had to you know continue to raise capital to grow and to invest in the brand and invest in operations. And they've been able to do that. Um, so that's been a that's been a wonderful journey to watch unfold, uh, based on just you know a good partnership. And so I would highlight that. Kunal? Uh, sure. Um, I think, uh, well, if I look at the numbers and I look at my current AUM, um, I think our, our biggest exposure today is with the company called Rapido, which is a bike taxi company out of Bangalore. Um, of course, when they came to us, they wanted to build a marketplace for, um, for mini trucks for hyperlocal delivery. We love the team, but we weren't sure about whether that was the right business opportunity for them. And we sort of talked to them about the potential of, of talking, uh, building a two-wheeler, um, you know, uh, ride-sharing business at that point. And one of the reasons was uh, Haryana government had just given permission 
or by tax fees in their state. Number two, uh, you know, Hero is, is an LP in our fund and they were looking for, um, you know, opportunities in that where they could, uh, you know, in, with, the, with, the use, with the use of two wheelers per se. Um, so we led that round, we invested in it. It took about six, eight, almost a year for them to perfect the model. They actually started with a bike factory model, which is what the government or regulation permitted. Uh, but we realized we were struggling to scale because it was becoming very difficult to convince people to buy a new bike and get it registered as a commercial vehicle. I think one of the biggest problems in India is this whole yellow number plate, white number plate, black number plate, green number plate. I mean, it's so stupid. So today I have to know before I make that investment, whether I'm going to use this car or two wheeler as a taxi or a self-driven taxi or a personal taxi. In America, you don't have those problems. You can take the same vehicle and keep changing the use case. Uh, that creates liquidity amongst the uh, multiple use case, which actually creates more efficient markets. Um, so which is why initially the government was very clear that you cannot use personal vehicles for commercial uses. Um, but ultimately, we had to figure out that this will not scale if we continue to get uh, bikes registered under the uh, commercial yellow number plate category. So then we went and did some creative thinking to say, okay, if I can't use a personal vehicle for commercial uses, can I use a personal vehicle for, uh, for example, uh, bike pooling? And instead of for profit, can I ask for a share of costs? So I know it's a workaround and it's sort of, we are bending the regulation or trying to read it the way you do. But I guess in India, you've got to do these creative thinkings and things like that. Uh, fortunately, the, the day we moved away from bike taxi to ride sharing or bike pooling, uh, we started growing 20% month on month. And I think pre COVID, these guys were doing almost 12 million rides a month and they've gone on to raise almost 100 million capital from these blue chip VCs, including Westbridge, Axel, et cetera. So that's definitely one success story. I'm on the board of Rapido, but it wasn't easy. I think the first three years was very, very tough. And I think that's another learning for us. We realized that there are two types of businesses. One where you're creating a category, you're a category creator, and where you're improving on an existing category. Both of them require very different go-to-market strategies. Category creator is focusing on getting product market fit right. Um, and if you're entering an existing category, then it's a land grab. So depending on what you're doing, you've got to execute accordingly. Um, I mean, so that's been a learning for us. I guess one in, uh, one uh, uh, failure, if you call it, was we ended up investing in a, in a, we got excited about an opportunity in cryptocurrency space. The company was called Crypto Space X. Uh, uh, three, four very talented guys from IIT Delhi. Um, first time entrepreneur, I mean, they were still in college when they came to us and we went to build them. Uh, this was when crypto, uh, you know, crypto uh, pricing was going off the charts. And these guys were sitting at in their college dorms and raising $3,000, $5,000 uh, by selling their tokens. And we realized that this is something really, um, you know, crazy. And I, it was more to understand and learn what this whole madness was all about. So we backed them, we put in a small check, not a large amount, but they were already profitable. They were generating revenue. Um, and they, they came and sat in our office so we learned a lot, but I think three things. One, we realized that uh, investing is not about us learning. It is more about us teaching and, and bringing, uh, you know, our skill sets to the table. So I think if you're, if you're investing for an education, then stick to college. Don't, don't become an investor. Uh, the second thing that we realized is that uh, it, uh, crypto for some reason seems to be a fad. So within six months of investing, the price of the currency dripped by almost 70, 80%. It became difficult for them to build a business and the company disbanded. Um, so it's an expensive uh, lesson for sure. So after that, we realized that nothing fancy, nothing, uh, no, no point going out there investing in the flavor of the month, stick to your core business. Um, and that's what we've been doing since then. But it was a very small check. So not a material amount, but um, I'm sure we could have learned much in a much cheaper way for sure. Here it. Yeah, so I think uh, yeah, so 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 we just exited Unifor, uh, you know, and we ended up uh, returning sixty percent of the first fund in a single shot, uh, and uh, you know uh, we we uh, had looked at them uh, way back in two thousand thirteen when we put the first check of a crore, okay, and then there were some secondaries which were available with NRDC which we put in another crore, so we ended up owning close to about sixteen seventeen percent of that company at that point in time. 
uh, uh, and then they went out to raise another uh, round uh, you know at a 4x valuation of our entry the price and then uh, uh, you know uh, one of the founders moved to uh, singapore uh, and then john chambers came in and invested in that uh, opportunity uh, you know idg came in as a co-investor as well uh, you know and then one of the founders moved back to the us as well you know, so so that was a very interesting learning in terms of how an enterprise saas model uh, building conversation ai platforms integrated in iit chennai actually you know went out to raise close to you know 80 90 million dollars in a matter of 3 years uh, and and uh, as early investors we we just exited that opportunity uh, you know so that kind of uh, you know has been a very interesting learning curve for us we understood so so at at, at one point in time the company was doing like uh, you know 2 million dollars in revenue but all of this coming from enterprise licenses and then uh, you know in 2015 we actually at a board level to a call to convert it uh, to a saas model uh, and suddenly you were you were back to zero literally in that sense and therefore uh, and we thought we could go back to 2 million dollars in like you know a couple of quarters but it took us uh, you know close to you know through two and a half three years to get back to 2 million dollar arr from a saas perspective but but what happened there was that the valuation actually uh, you know went up multiple folds you know as an enterprise license i would have gotten an x value as a saas business we got a you know 8x value literally in that sense and therefore uh you know that could that became a very interesting learning curve and a pivot for that organization uh so that's been a very uh, interesting learning curve uh the other company that which we kind of uh, you know uh, which was not so successful but it was the, so these guys came to us uh, you know they they had a very interesting cap table where everybody who uh, who's who on the angel investing world uh, including founders of all the large unicorns were on the cap table uh, when they came to us to raise a 300000 dollar round uh and by the time we went back to them the 300000 dollar round was done and dusted uh, so we kind of you know help, uh, uh, you know held them by the neck scruff of the neck and told them to take our 50000 dollars as well um hoping uh, that in the next round when they want to raise serious money they would uh, it would be at a valuation where a lot of angel investors typically don't uh, you know double down uh but that valuation was like 4x of what we came in at in the first round uh the company was starting to do very well it was a very difficult decision internally to you know pass that uh, investment opportunity because we were raising a million dollars at an 8 million pre money way back in 2016 on a 300 or 400 thousand dollar arr which was very difficult to you know digest internally from a valuation perspective uh but uh, um, unfortunately 70% of their business actually came from a single uh you know entity which was also on the cap table and then one day the entrepreneur decided uh, you know that that entrepreneur decided that you know he uh, they can actually do the same thing internally much better than what this company was doing and suddenly 70% of the revenue went off the table you know and in in 4 months we had to uh, you know exit it you know 12 cents to a dollar you know uh, and that was kind of uh, you know shocking because the way the company was scaling up and the way the revenue was uh, you know piling up uh and suddenly in 4 months you were actually you know you don't have money to pay salaries literally that and so and therefore you know uh and we been we'd been pushing back on the founder time and time again that you know this concentration of risk that you have because you have a single uh, uh you know customer who account for 60 70% of the revenue is not a good place to be in but they went to tech stars and they went through the entire hula hoop and but it just they just couldn't scale up other customers and then when the rug got pulled from under their feet there was no coming back so that's been a great uh, uh, learning experience as well you know uh, one thing we at fund level talk about what is called the anti portfolio you know opportunities that you could have invested in but you didn't you know so that list is long and and needs a couple of drinks uh, in my system before i can start talking about some of that stuff <laughs> thank you gentlemen um and and girish share the anti portfolio is a uh, um, probably a question we'll shy away from today uh, but uh, uh, but but you know we're, we're trying to we have about 15 to 20 more minutes left we'll try to close at about 665 i know kunal also has a hard stop around 610 um so uh, we'll shift over a little bit to the angel investing side the 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 second part of our discussion um you know for folks who are wanting to be angel investors um how can they start 
uh, what should is there anything different they should be doing uh, you know uh, so if i want to put you know 5 lakh 10 lakh rupees in a startup what are the pros and cons clearly probably i would want to do it in an area of domain knowledge for me but you know should that be the model should that not be the model uh, you know should i get on the india angel network or whatever you know mumbai um, angel um, so and so forth so and then of course lastly you know is the criteria any different uh, vis a vis the people component of the institutional vc um, so you know i know it's it's a very broad topic it could probably last us a few hours to just cover all the questions i asked but and it's highly unfair to ask it uh, in in all composite but just in the interest of time perhaps atul we can start with you uh, uh, you know you can talk a little bit about uh, your view of angel investing its differences and then we can move to kunal and uh, and girish thank you sure i i'll, I'll be i'll be brief on this one cuz i'm actually uh, trying to learn more about this myself so uh, i think it's something definitely uh, that is interesting i i've been fortunate because of because of what I do, because I know a lot of uh, fund, um, you, you know, I think when you're doing angel investing, ideally for me, I don't have a do domain expertise necessarily. So I try to find people who are smart and uh, piggyback. So I've had uh, the opportunity for the few angel investments that I've made uh, have been through funds where, you know, because of goodwill and because I've helped them with, with other aspects of their business, they let me, you know, come into some of their deals. Um, but in general, I would just say it's something where you, you, you do, as you mentioned, you need to have either some domain expertise or you need to be with somebody who has that domain expertise and at least knows whether or not there's a fighting chance uh, of survival because you are at that extreme uh, uh, side of the risk spectrum. But I, I, Kunal and Girish will probably have more uh, substantive um, uh, views to share on that. Yeah, sure. Uh, so, first of all, my question is, why do you want to be an angel investor? Um, you know, it sounds, uh, no, no. So, I've been, I've been an angel investor, of course. So, I've, I've learned from my mistakes. I think there's a couple of rulings, of course. One is, um, first of all, yeah, you know, it's tough to find good deals. So, first start by telling you that, you know, from an entrepreneur's point of view, um, you know, fundraising in terms of there is a waterfall that entrepreneurs themselves follow. Um, their first port of call will be blue chip VCs. I mean, let's face it, if we're all entrepreneurs, that's where we'd want to start as well, right? Um, then if they're, if they're not getting, either they don't have, don't have access to them or they're too turned away from them, then they go to the next next tier of, which are maybe the, the second, uh, you know, not the blue chip VCs, but the second one, the seed investors and things like that. Then they go to these angel platforms. Uh, etc cetera, etc cetera. so as you can see there is a filter that happens so ultimately unfortunately many of the deals that come to um, uh, and companies which are uh, looking at angel investors are maybe not in the top 20 percent of the quality of founders that you want to back in the first place so that's it i mean i just want to put that as a caveat so make sure you do enough diligence to to and see why the reason why they're raising from angels is not because they've been rejected from every other fund in the market but it's probably somebody that you know, and therefore you have uh, already have some sort of relationship with the founders. Um, second is, uh, first of all, you should probably definitely have a high enough um, net worth um, and liquid, uh, liquid assets of maybe, I don't know the number, two crores, four crores, six crores, it depends. It's a personal thing. And do not put more than two to 5% of your total liquid assets in this asset class because it's highly volatile. And um, there is a there is a probability of if you ending up with zero returns, writing off every single check that you make. Third is um, it's rather like think of it like Rule, uh, where you're going to put you know I don't know what it's Rule has thirty six numbers on the table, um, so you're going to have to make at least thirty six investments before you can get a get a return on one of them. Yeah, think of it like that. I think the number is twenty. Uh, there are enough people who've done that analysis. Don't do angel investment and stop at five or six. Keep going till you have at least 20 investments. Only then will you probably recover uh, all your money and, and uh, you'll have to make probably 30 investments if you want to start probably delivering a two to three X on what you've made. Um, so those are the different things. I mean, I, I, in my selfish interest, I would say that if you're looking to deploy certain amounts of capital, you should always consider coming in as an LP 
but that again most lps have a slightly higher threshold level um, lps uh, funds by the way they operate are professional investors who actually ultimately help you diversify your investments across these 25 so called investments which is typically what a fund will do so in a way um, uh, funds like uh, your net uh, and an advantage actually act as angel investment platforms where the, your capital is getting distributed amongst those 25 and you've got professionals who are making those sound decisions and i'm not trying to raise capital here what i'm saying is that if you have the ability to do both angel investment is a great idea to understand what's going on but um, make an investment in an area that you are already uh, very good at it could be an existing domain where you're bringing value to a, a founder and maybe that's why he'd be happy to take your check try to co-invest along with the fund if you have relationships because funds once they've invested will actually manage that investment and help you at least minimize your risk um uh, i mean those are the four or five criteria that i would do girish Oh, no, absolutely. You know, so so incidentally, our first fund was actually called a angel fund. It was called your next angel fund. You know, and uh, and the reason we did that was essentially because when we started in two thousand eleven, there were angel networks, but the early stage VC asset class was still evolving, and there was literally no angel fund. So we actually went out and created a category in itself called angel fund. You know, and that was a time when. say be allowed you to take 25 lakh rupee commitments from your investors uh, you know today that uh, threshold is a crore at least you know for aif uh, uh, category for uh, category 1 funds and and you know so so the way we went about doing this and and uh, we were first time fund managers uh, so we went uh, we ended up raising money 94% of that money was raised domestically across 145 individual investors you know so this asset class from outside looks very very aspirational and sexy because you hear about you know somebody who invested 8 lakhs in ptm was is worth 800 crores today etc etc but as kunal said this is a very very risky asset class for every one ptm that you hear there are 999 ptms that actually died and therefore diversification is extremely important uh whatever you deploy uh, you know uh, in in an angel category is the money that you should be willing to mentally write off because the because you know if you're not diversified well enough uh, you know and not stay long enough the chances that you will see that money back is extremely extremely uh, poor uh, and therefore uh, uh, you know uh, as kunal rightly said not more than 2 4 5% of error investable surplus goes into an asset class like that potentially you could make 3x Uh, but uh, you know, and that will give you a, a couple of you know tens of bips alpha on your entire portfolio from an investment perspective. Is essentially an asset diversification strategy. Uh, the money that you deploy here should be the money that you can actually put up in a pile of uh, paper and light fire and say go your hath literally in that sense. उससे ज़्यादा मत करना इस asset class में it's it's uh, you know and and diversification and timeliness. and founders that you are comfortable working with are the three things that you should look at a lot of uh, you know entrepreneurs go out and raise friends family round as they call them uh, you know people they pull capital from 5 10 people to 5 lakhs each raise a 40 50 lakh corpus and go out and you know start try and build get a product market fit uh, do that only if you know the founder well and you have you know confidence in their capabilities uh, you know just taking a punt on uh, on somebody you don't know is probably not the right thing to do uh, or the best thing to do for you thank you gentlemen so uh, just to extend that argument a wee bit um you know i uh, let's say i have a dear friend who uh, i have known for 10 years comes up with an idea that i don't really know much about um and is raising a round um as professional venture capitalists would you advise putting money in it girish uh, depends on the ticket size depends on your understanding uh, your relationship with the uh, the founder uh, you know a lot of this stuff that we do at, between friends is essentially moral in nature not necessary fiduciary you know and therefore uh, if you if you have that level of comfort uh you know uh, in the founder and his ability to deliver and if there are some early signs that you can validate speaking to his customer or speaking to his peer you know uh, uh you know employees other founders etc 
you can take a call okay but as i said just doing one or two or five is not sufficient and therefore if you want to deploy a crore in in this asset class or 50 lakhs in this asset class do it in two two three three four four lakh chips you know uh, and and spread the risk because at that stage mortality is 90 95% you know and therefore you have to understand the risks uh, that that get associated with that level that high level of mortality uh, if you don't understand some of those risks and you go hope that you will put 5 lakhs and get 50 lakhs 5 years from now you know that's like being unreal yeah i was just going to add one again just adding on again you if you cannot evaluate the um, if you like somebody or you get posed an opportunity, what I find is find somebody who is qualified to evaluate it a little bit better than you are, right? And then that helps you at least know is it in the funnel of potentially getting you a return? Are they viable? But someone like Kunal, like Girish, like you know other other people who you might have in your network, maybe people from that industry can tell you is this a potentially viable business opportunity? Then you take the risk and you know you knowingly, but at least your wide eyes wide open. That it has the potential to uh, to be successful. Right. Okay. Yeah. No. Absolutely. I I think you know even I would say from my personal experience, um, you know, um, I've tried my hand at angel investing. I've tried my hand at uh, personal uh, public market investing, and uh, I uh, uh, and I can say that some of my best returns have come by putting money with the right funds. Uh, and you know, not only has that saved time, but it's a more efficient use of capital. And it's done in a way that uh, you know, maximizes returns and minimizes risks because it's amply diversified to the point that all of you made. Uh, so uh, I think um, not to make this uh, a pitch for investing in VC funds or private equity funds or uh, funds of uh, different alternative asset classes, but for anybody wanting to be an angel investor, uh, it's not a bad idea to consider starting by being a limited partner or an investor into an alternative investment fund. Uh, and for most people who come from technology or you know, startup type backgrounds, to perhaps consider funds like uh, Girish's and Kunal's, uh, because not only can they give you the ability to generate an extraordinary return on capital, but they can also give you the ability to get deeper into very interesting segments of the market. And in certain cases also turn, you know, educational opportunities to learn what's going on, what's hot, what are the trends? Because, you know, they, these are the guys thinking about it on a continuous basis. Uh, my last question for today sorry uh, atul did you have a point just one just to finish what you were saying you know it's interesting that some of the largest is not just uh, uh, hnis and individuals but some of the largest families in the country follow the strategy that you just outlined they invested with funds to understand get exposure you know and and, and now then they start to you know perhaps get it onto their own but it's an excellent learning ground i just want to share that yeah, absolutely. I, and you know, for for those of you who are interested, you can study the uh, endowments um, in the U.S. predominantly, but world over, uh, that have slowly over the last fifty years changed the percentage of their portfolio increasingly into alternative asset classes, and thereby uh, not only increasing the effective return on the portfolio, but also being better able to manage the asset liability um, issues that, you know, long-term capital has. Um, okay, um, uh, you know, one of the last questions uh, that has come up, and there are a few other questions that I can answer once you guys, uh, I know Kunal has to run, uh, which are more, you know, very technical, very specific questions. Uh, but one, one interesting question that has come up probably from some of the younger alums, uh, and probably even seasoned alums is, how can I get into a BC or an angel fund? What are the skill sets and experiences required to join um, a venture capital fund? Uh, so uh, perhaps we can hear from Girish and Kunal on the early stage venture capital fund uh, skill sets. 
and and Atul, from you on the late stage uh, private equity side, because there are different skill sets. Um, so, uh, uh, Atul, do you want to go first? Uh, sure. So, you know, it, it is a very uh, uh, it, it's a shallow market, and uh, so it's a very difficult market uh, to break into because the amount of people. I think Girish was talking about how it seems sexy. It seems like a very sexy industry, and people are attracted to it. So, there's a lot of people who want to do it. Um, and there's few spots, um, but um, typically what people will look for in the later stage, you know, you're, you're looking for uh, a pedigree matters um, because they have the ability. To, because there's such a limited number of spots and there's such a big pool of candidates, they can choose to be very selective. So, depending on the organization, you, ha you have to find a place that would value what your pedigree and what your background is certain shops would want somebody who has international and Indian exposure. Certain people would want um, operational exposure, industry exposure, consulting exposure, um, uh, you know, but by and large, people would look for excellence. So they would either like you to be associated with excellent institutions and have performed well there, um, whether these are academic institutions or whether these are uh, corporate institutions. Um, and that, that's a starting point. Um, beyond that, you, you know, some of it can be perseverance and connections and the same networking that one would find. But uh, I, I would say the good thing is because it's a shallow market, you won't have to look forever. You'll know who the people are who you can go out to. Uh, but it, it, it's a tough, it's a tough ride uh, because it's a limited plan. But focusing on your excellence and your pedigree and what you have to offer to the table, specifically to that institution, whether it's their strategy, whether it's their background, their approach. Would be the way to try to find that that linkage um, to make a mark. Yeah, so I can go next. Uh, no, so uh, you're right. I mean, because uh, typically the size of funds are pretty small; they're not very large, um, and because we run on a cohort-based system, so I guess uh, the skill sets required that also vary depending on. The, the structure and the focus of a fund. So, for example, very, very early stage funds like our, ours, at least. Um, so, you know, even I would, you know, define startups in different stages. So, there is the minus one to zero, which are founders who want to become entrepreneurs and don't know what they do. That's typically what we call mentor building. And there's zero to one, which are people who have just started and are trying to build product market fit, uh, proof of concept, and proof of acceptance. I think funds that are focusing in that minus uh, one to zero and zero to one um, probably require uh, team members who are very, very um, operationally inclined in the sense that who themselves have entrepreneurial mindsets because every day the challenge that the portfolio company is facing is different. Um, you cannot manage a portfolio like that via an Excel sheet because unfortunately India has such a complex and complicated market where the environment changes every day. So even our investment decisions have never ever ever been based on what uh, a, a company submits to us um, in terms of a business plan. We use that more as a proxy to see if they've thought through uh, the different challenges and the assumptions rather than the actual numbers that go into it because 99% of our portfolio companies have got their projections wrong. Um, the, the key to, to partnering with the, or the qualities they're looking for as team members are actually people who've gone through the pain of entrepreneurship. And uh, typically we end up hiring people who have at least one failure behind them. Uh, success is fine, but one failure is important because failure teaches you humility. And failure also uh, gives you a very high level of emotional intelligence. These are two qualities that are very, very important if you're dealing with other entrepreneurs. We don't want our team members to be arrogant to think that if I'm providing capital, they have to listen to what we have to do. Um, ultimately, we are in there with them. We are uh, helping them on a day-to-day -day basis. And conversely, what we have seen is entrepreneurs are more willing to listen to people who actually built companies themselves and have gone through that process. Um, uh, they will probably not listen to the same uh, with the same level of intent if they are talking to people who have always uh, been consultants or have have been career VCs. Um, and this is at early stage. Uh, the, but the, but when you go from the one to ten kind of stage, 
then the skill set becomes highly different. Now you're talking about investors who have uh, experience in the area of scaling, who understand metrics, who are now getting more and more structured. So companies who are now in that stage of operations need to create organizational structures and matrices and, 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 and KPIs and targets and monitor them on a different basis. Now that's more structured way of thinking. And that is where people who are actually career VCs or investors will probably succeed much better. So those are the ways we sort of look at different phases of, of startups and match that to the different types of investors and therefore the different types of skill sets and the different types of people we should hire compared to those who are doing late stage investments or growth. Yeah. So I think I think uh, it's important to also, uh, you know, everything Kunal said is absolutely on this on the dot. Yeah. I think I think what what one needs to also understand is the what is the core functions that a, a VC does. Okay. So there is there is this entire fundraise that happens. Yes, please mute your line. Uh, go ahead, please, Girish. Girish, you're muted. Eh? Please unmute yourself. I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, so I'm saying, you know, so it, it's, a, it's a function of how uh, the entire uh, VC uh, firm is structured. Okay. There are clearly three, four uh, roles that come to mind. One is this entire fundraise role, you know. So if you have worked in a fund of fund or if you worked in, you know, in, in markets where you have access to, you know, ultra HNIs, relationship guys, etc. You know, a fundraising role is an extremely interesting, uh, you know, evolution. Uh, the other role is this entire role about portfolio management, you know. So how do you, uh, each fund will have 15, 20, 25 companies that they are managing at a point in time. And therefore, do you have the operational uh, expertise and the skill set to be able to, uh, you know, add value there? So that's the other vertical uh, that is potential. Then third one is the deal flow vertical, where you know you are constantly sifting through hundreds of proposals, uh, you know, every every month, literally, to get to the right proposals that fit your investment thesis from a stage perspective, etc. And therefore, that's a slightly more, you know. Uh, analytical and you know you need to understand cross vertical exposure is important etc you know so those are the broad two three categories that that exist in a in a in a in a vc fund you know, and therefore where your skill sets uh, can add most value uh, you know is something that you should look at uh, is what would, that's what i would think yeah I, I would also offer you know most people find that the investing role is the you know the, the sexy role that everyone wants so just for the for the younger people out there i, I you know one line to keep in mind maybe that you know investing uh, and you know kunal girish tell me if you disagree but it's it's an apprenticeship so it's a very long process and if you are looking to get into this industry in this sector um whether it's on the early stage or the uh, uh you know uh, later stage of vc you need to have a very long-term perspective and be realistic about the path um that you un unfold um, you know, and it can be a very rewarding just from the type of people you meet, the energy, the excitement, the highs, the lows, but it is a long journey and, you know, it takes a while to get to be in the position where uh, some of the people you read about or you, you know, you see on these types of webinars are. So. Yeah, absolutely, yes. gentlemen. One last point I'd like to add is most people think of in, uh, VCs are investing as a job of deploying capital. Uh, we like to joke amongst our team ki, yeah, that even a monkey can throw a dart on the wall and deploy capital. Our real work actually starts once the money hits the bank. Right. And after that, it's a lot of grunt work. It's a lot of, you know, you know, strategy, thinking, execution, management, KPI, customer, blah, blah, blah. That's the dirty work. Um, and, and pressure. And pressure. And then fundraising. And, and suddenly within, you know, six months, you're back there with your founders in the trenches trying to raise your next round of capital. We get rewarded, and I'm sure you know, people listening in need to understand also that most VCs uh, typically work at uh, significantly less salary than market. Um, so you, we also have just like entrepreneurs, and that's another thing that's very important. Most entrepreneurs think that they're sacrificing by taking less than market salary for six, seven years till their companies are successful. 
but guess what vcs also typically uh, make much less than their market salaries and uh, we work for a, what's called a carry earnout structure which we only get paid if we are able to deliver superior returns to our investors so if our funds don't do well we would have given up 7 8 years of our life by making pennies on what uh, on on what we should have made in in corporate jobs so we, i mean we understand that vcs also end up sacrificing a lot um so it's not just what you read in the papers it's actually very very hard work um and and ultimately we may not end up making what we would have made if we had continued to be you know consultants and and uh, and uh, work in corporate environments so we're both in it together we can't succeed till you guys succeed and for us also it's an 8 to 9 year journey before we make uh, uh, decent amounts of return yeah that's a fantastic uh point sunal it's uh, it's important to highlight i think uh, like at the onset we said humility is flowing so uh, you you can see that uh, to be a successful entrepreneur and to be a successful investor humility is important i just add one more point uh, since i teach a class on this topic most fresh mbas ask me how they can get into venture early stage especially and i keep telling them that the best thing for you is not to go into venture right away but do a startup do an operating role and and that way you will actually earn the respect of the entrepreneur like kunal was pointing out uh, eventually if and when you get into that role and unless you actually sort of gone through the trenches yourself uh, it's not something that's easy to do and i think that's a, also a reflective on our panel today everybody on the panel uh, has been in an operating role and has you know uh, in certain case been an entrepreneur successfully scaled or failed uh, whatever the case may be uh, and kunal and girish have both identified and atul identified the value of uh, failure uh, as a part of this process not to be undermined in fact someone's posted a comment love the idea on checking failure and its implications on a person Uh, not spoken so many times uh, or not well understood sometimes but uh, typically a better teacher than success so uh, with that um, i think we will formally call this uh, webinar to a close i want to thank the three of you uh, immensely for taking such an important block of your time on a saturday late afternoon uh, so uh, a round of drinks is owed by me <laughs> post covid if and when that happens i don't know with the news that we hear on different graphs that the channels are showing uh, till 2022 it's almost scary to think that we'll have a similar lifestyle for for eternity but hopefully uh, we can catch up in person soon and again gentlemen thank you so much for taking the time and sharing your valuable insights and thoughts thank you thank you Thanks so much mate the people all mine yeah. thank you Uh, i know kunal has to run uh, uh, and i don't know about you too but there are two or three more questions that i don't mind answering they're uh, sort of uh, technical questions so we can answer them uh, but again thank you so much for your time gentlemen thanks a lot guys thank, thank you kunal bye take care bye thank you sir uh, so uh, girish i don't know if you want to take this but uh, Uh, there's a question about uh, you know as an entrepreneur should i have a simple partnership should i have an llp uh, i guess it's better off to have a private limited but maybe you can throw some thoughts on it uh, and the second question is uh, a company name shall be the same as a product name or different so you know the 197 communications is having a product called paytm any advantages or disadvantages of this approach Uh, so let me answer the first question first you know i think if you are in the long haul you know then i think uh, you know expecting investors to come in in an lp and llp is being unreal and therefore you know putting a private limited structure around it uh, will save you the hassle of reincorporating and you know the entire flip structure etc so so if you are in the long haul i know it's paperwork it's cost it's time but it's better to put put a, a private limited company uh, you know right up front and get it done industry also if you have other co-founders it is always better to get your your internal shareholder agreements you know in order 
to understand your roles and responsibilities etc clearly articulated so that there is no uh, you know scope of interpretation uh, different interpretations you know so that's on the first one uh, on the second one you know uh, typically we've seen that you know brands and company names are different you know because a company could could have multiple brands or multiple product lines that they work with you know for example we have a company in testing automation platform which has uh, you know two different products one for the enterprise segment which is branded differently and the other other for the consumer segment which is branded differently so typically uh, you know and and the money that goes uh, uh, in in building the brand goes behind the uh, product itself and not necessarily the company so the company in that the name of the company in that sense is incidental um, and therefore you know uh, uh, it is not necessarily that both should be named similarly uh, you know sometimes you will not get a trademark for example for a company name and therefore you will need to build a product which is slightly more differently named than the, uh, the you know than the company itself and therefore you know so uh, there are the, there is no you know rule around this you know typically we've seen that uh, you know if if a company has a vision to build multiple products then the product names and the company names are generally different i hope that answers it yeah absolutely there's another question atul that perhaps you can take uh, you know uh, the somebody is interested in uh, esg slash clean investing in vc uh, i mean both of you can probably throw color on it starting with you atul uh, in terms of uh, you know what's going on with respect to uh, uh, clean investing has the fad gone away is it still there you know market for renewables um, and uh, uh, you know if the limited partners are inclined towards that sort of investing post covid yeah so it's it's a great question it's definitely uh, very relevant in an indian context because of india by by nature being an emerging market um esg development um sdg impact sustainability there's a whole plethora of uh, of words that are in this world uh and it, it's definitely um uh, something which is of interest to many people i think impact and sustainability uh the definitions are all over the place so that's one thing to be very clear about what you're trying to accomplish uh esg often refers to metrics which a company might be evaluated on like how is that company operating by environmental guidelines social guidelines and governance guidelines esg um and you know there's a lot of information out there the ifc uh, international finance corporation they 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 publish something called the performance standards um cdc which is a uk uh, government development body they uh, publish uh, their standards on um on esg um so it, it definitely is something of interest um i think more and more companies are saying that esg has to be incorporated into every single uh, company as a way of doing business because if you're doing business and you're adhering to environmentally sound uh, uh, socially sound and governance sound principles then it should translate into better returns so this is what you're hearing I, on on venture companies on earlier companies there's less re uh, relevance in some of the buckets it becomes more of an issue as you become an operating company and you're larger um and then on impact and sustainability there are many investors who are looking at this um post covid this has become something that people are looking at um and another trend i would highlight along the same lines is something on gender balancing and gender equality this is another huge trend in the asset management industry where investors are looking to support women uh, entrepreneurs women uh, vc funds uh, or at least gender balanced funds where there's a mix of women and men as well so those are two things i can i can share girish no no i think i think atul has covered most of it i don't think i have anything else to add uh, so um i think uh, uh, as i just looked through the questions i think we're all set um my my perhaps my last question uh that i uh, I'm, i'm framing here uh, probably something that a lot of people have uh, asked me uh, either in the classroom setting or, or otherwise is uh, uh, you know as a as an investor um 
what is the um, one skill set that you think helps you become more successful? It doesn't, not necessarily as an institutional uh, investor, just as, a, as an investor. Um, is it your ability to a certain people and their character? Is it your ability to, uh, you know, understand markets and products? Is it your ability to raise money? Clearly, it's all all of them. But if you were to prioritize, um, how you know how would you think about it? Yeah. So I think I think uh, you know uh, ability to assess people and ability to raise capital are right on top. You know. Uh, one without the other does not really, uh, you know, make sense. And therefore, I would typically go with when. So when we are evaluating opportunities, as Kunal said, uh, you know, uh, earlier in the, in the discussion, that you know, is the entrepreneur really sell? Can he sell? Is is translated into the entrepreneur's capability and ability to raise capital? And then uh, the the entire discussion about people we had in terms of you know. Uh, what kind of uh, skill sets what kind of uh, drives them what is the level of perseverance you know tenacity etc that they bring to the table you know, so these two will be typically you know neck to neck literally depending on what stage uh, you know one is looking at from an investment perspective uh, you know everything else is literally not comparable yeah i think one thing i can from the investors that you know that we, that i've worked with and that i've um evaluated over times the ones that are successful over a uh, uh sustainable and over a long period of time they're also very disciplined uh and they're disciplined in terms of their approach their focus um and the, the same way that an entrepreneur because it, it is many common traits between a venture capitalist uh and an entrepreneur uh and you know who's running a company because in, in many similar traits but having that discipline to maintain your focus, stick to your knitting, um, and have the perseverance to write it out. Ultimately, if you can do that on a repeatable basis, you have the chance to uh, yield results is what, what, I, what I've noticed from the folks that I've worked with. Yeah, absolutely, Atul. Okay, gentlemen, so uh, I know you've uh, been very generous with your time. Uh, we're, we're already overboard with a few minutes. I don't wanna hold you back on a Saturday evening. Thank you so much. So we'll formally call this to a close. And uh, again, really appreciate uh, you guys taking the time. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Have a great weekend, guys. Yeah, pleasure meeting you, Atul. Have, and thank you, everyone. Bye. Likewise, Take care. Bye-bye.